Good morning, everyone. I'm Alan Garber, the provost, and I'm here to welcome you to the second day of the Vision and Justice Convening. The event began yesterday, as you all know, with sessions at Radcliffe, which were very successful, and I am thrilled to see such a great crowd here today, despite the hour and the weather. As some of you know, the Vision and Justice Symposium was conceived by Sarah Lewis. Sarah? Sarah is an assistant professor of, in the Department of Art, the History of Art and Architecture, and the Department of African and African American Studies. This event emerged from work that she did as guest editor of the Vision and Justice issue of the photography journal Aperture. In Sarah's words, this issue centered on the question of how the foundational right of representation in a democracy, the right to be recognized justly, has historically been and is still urgently tied to the work of the arts in the public realm. This conference provides an important forum to explore the role of culture in enlarging our sense of who counts in society. The speakers you will hear from today represent a diverse array of perspectives and professional backgrounds. We hope that the rich discussion will provide new insights into the power of art and culture in helping us all better understand racial equity and justice in the United States. This meeting is an example of Harvard at its best. First, it demonstrates how serious scholarship can help to advance social goals. It was born out of research and teaching. Many of the speakers here today draw upon deep wells of scholarly work that have informed conversations about representation in the public eye. As an art historian, Sarah was inspired to pursue this topic by her close reading of words that Frederick Douglass wrote 150 years ago. Sarah teaches a general education class here at Harvard called Vision and Justice. And in fact, a second Vision and Justice issue of Aperture, published in conjunction with this convening, includes a number of essays by Harvard students. Second, the discussions at this event span disciplines, departments, and schools. The Vision and Justice convening calls for a greater collaboration within the university, along with connections to the broader community. This work is strengthened by the breadth of perspectives and approaches there represents. It spans the visual arts, the environment, culture, the political realm, and technology. It brings a truly wide lens. This event also brings together diverse members from within and outside the Harvard community. In addition to all of you here in the audience, many of you have traveled great distances, I know, to be here. Viewers all over the world can tune in to the live stream. I'd like to thank Sarah for her leadership. This convening truly could not have happened without you as the driving force. Thank you also to Tomiko Brown-Nagan and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study for hosting this event, and to the Ford Foundation for its generous support. I'd also like to acknowledge the event's co-sponsors, the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research, the Harvard Art Museums, and the American Repertory Theater. Finally, Michelle Coffey at the Lambent Foundation and the Aperture Foundation provided critical support for the publication. Now, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Darren Walker. I suspect that many, many of you in this room are very familiar with Darren and what a special person he is. 
Aaron has been president of the Ford Foundation for about six years. He was trained as an attorney. He has dedicated himself to a career in social justice philanthropy. He previously served as vice president at the Rockefeller Foundation and before that as COO of the Abyssinian Development Corporation, Harlem's largest community development organization. Uh, I could go on and on about his past and his accomplishments, but it would take too much of your time and Darren would be offended. He's made that quite clear. But I do have to mention he's involved in many community organizations. He has many, many honors, including 13 honorary degrees from different universities. And sorry, Darren, I have to mention that you won the W.E.B. Du Bois Medal right here at Harvard. Darren has had a truly outsized influence on this event. Conversations with him helped shape the agenda. He has been a long-standing thought partner and a major contributor to the understanding of the intersection of art and justice. He has been an inspiration for many of the panelists and distinguished speakers with us today and many of the rest of us as well. Darren. On behalf of all of us at Harvard, thank you for your steadfast commitment to advancing opportunity and equality and to improving the lives of countless people. You are truly dedicated to bringing out the best in humanity. Please join me now in welcoming Darren. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you and thank you, Alan, for that very gracious and generous introduction, and good morning, everyone. It is indeed a great morning here in beautiful, bucolic Cambridge, Massachusetts. I, too, want to join in thanking everyone who is made today possible, but starting with the president of this great university who has created an environment in which scholars like Sarah Lewis and many of you in this room can flourish. Of course, the brilliant Tamiko and the Radcliffe Institute makes us all so proud. I have to also, of course, recognize my friend Henry Louis Gates Jr., the singular force that Skip is at the Hutchins Center, the Harvard Art Museums, Diane, Paulus, wherever you are, Thank you, and of course, my long-standing shero, Drew Faust. Drew, it was your leadership that began to champion Sarah as a person this university needed. And I think today is a testament to the fact that you were right. I want... Alan mentioned that I have been speaking out about why art matters in a society that is increasingly growing unequal. And on that journey with me have been philanthropists who are doing the work like Michelle Coffey at Lambert, like Elizabeth Alexander at Mellon, and so many more. But we have been inspired by my friend, Dr. Sarah Lewis. Sarah, my dazzling, brilliant, intelligent, fierce, and courageous sister. It took courage to organize, conceptualize, and implement, execute your vision. And your vision is indeed vision and justice, but it's a vision for justice. And what we have learned from Sarah is the importance of art in a just society. We know that from the study of art, from the engagement with the arts, from the creative process, we build empathy 
And without empathy, there really can't be justice. So America today needs the arts, needs the humanities more than ever. We need light in this time of darkness where every day we are confronted with greed, avarice, vulgarity, vileness. At an appalling level, we are confronted with it on a daily basis in this country. And yet, there is light. Amidst all this darkness, there is light. And it is here today in this room, in all of you, and what we will hear on this stage. And I want to close with something that, as an American who loves my country deeply and feels so proud to be an American, how I must reconcile my patriotism with my anger and rage. It's from a poet, my favorite poet, who, like me, was black, gay, lived part of his life in Harlem, and had roots in the American South. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath. But opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. The free, who said the free? Not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when they strike. The millions who have nothing for our pay, for all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream, the dream that's almost dead today. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Thank you. How have we enlarged our notion of who counts in society? The clip that you just saw placed the descendants of the signers of the Declaration of Independence in the precise positions of their ancestors. We saw there a transit between one version of America to that of our current day, and the question that it prompted in me is one that I am so honored to be able to hear our speakers today consider. Has that journey been simply a legal narrative, or is it also a cultural one? Why use that painting that shows the signing of the Declaration of Independence to start to tease out that idea? In 1790, the definition of citizenship was to be white, to be male, to be able to hold property. How have we arrived at the more inclusive but still contested definition of citizenship today? As an art historian, you might imagine that I don't believe that the answer is simply a legal narrative. It is also a cultural one. What are the inflection points along that journey that let us understand the work of culture and the work of the arts for justice? This is what brings us together today. 
In many ways, I, I am simply standing here, yes, as a professor here in the history of art and architecture and African and African American studies, and I'm so honored to be teaching here, but I am standing here for many, many others, and I'd like to briefly salute them. I couldn't imagine doing the work here at Harvard that all of us are in terms of considering this expanded notion of who counts and who belongs without the leadership of President Bacow. In your installation address, you charged us to consider the contributory function the for education as a public good in society. And my hope is that what we will hear today can exemplify that charge and that ideal. Thank you for your leadership. Conversations with our now professor and President Emerita Drew Faust seeded ideas for this convening the Cultural Citizenship Initiative that she began as Dean at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study creates a model for today's proceedings. And so it was an honor to receive an invitation from our former Dean Lisbeth Cohen and with the ex extraordinary leadership of our current Dean Tamiko Brown-Nagan to consider this work as being hosted at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. I could not be more grateful for the rigorous, extraordinary, dedicated leadership that you provide, Tamiko, and that your staff and the leadership at the organization there has offered to the convening. So thank you. Let's give them a round of applause, please. There are many to thank, and it's because this is deliberately not a conference, but a convening, a coming together of many who have been doing this work. It began as well with conversations between myself and Michelle Coffey at the Lambin Foundation, Elizabeth Alexander now at the Mellon Foundation, and Darren Walker at the Ford Foundation, three visionaries who are allowing for work like this to proceed and to continue. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. There are many students here, the Vision and Justice Ambassadors, who have worked tirelessly on this conference. I thank you for your time and your dedication. There's one other individual that I'd like to thank. The, in addition to the co-sponsors, the Hutchins Center, the American Repertory Theater, the Harvard Art Museums. And that person is a man named Shadrach Emanuel Lee. He was studying in 1926 and in New York City in high school, and he just wanted to know really one question from his history teacher in the 11th grade. He just wanted to know why the history books didn't look like the world around him. And the question that he asked was, was met with an answer that surprised him. He was told that African Americans in particular had done nothing to merit inclusion in those textbooks. And he didn't accept that as an answer, and so he was expelled for his impertinence. And he never went back to high school. He never got a college degree, but he became an artist. This man was my grandfather. And my name, Sarah Elizabeth Lewis, is meant to honor him. But I mention it tonight because I, I hope he is somewhere smiling, also knowing that two generations later in America, here at Harvard, we can consider the very question that he was expelled for asking about those two generations ago. So, with that, I want to dedicate this convening to the students who dare to ask the questions that we need to hear, the future that has rushed in and will not wait. A student of mine, Lance Oppenheim, is an extraordinary filmmaker, the youngest contributor to the New York Times and the Op, Op Docs department. <laughs> and he created a film that will let me uh, get off the stage more quickly as well, but will also give you a sense of what happens in the classroom and what takes place here on this campus. And I'll say a few words after that uh, to introduce the next panel. But please, uh, now, let's give a hand to Lance Oppenheim, who's here, and then we'll, we'll show the video. One of the things that's so unique about this particular medium is that it's been both used to honor human life and to deliberately denigrate it. 
Photography was weaponized through the history of racial science to prove polygenesis. What is lost if you don't understand the history of African-American photography is the incredible amount of work that has been done to create counter narratives that offer the productive corrective moves with an honor and dignity that we're still striving to put on various magazine pages, newspaper pages. You see this parallel path of insistent humanity, insistent dignity. I think American citizenship has long been about this merger of pictures and progress. You all wrote extraordinary response papers. Many of you focused on the way in which the camera ultimately is used not just by someone like Gordon Parks, but in general, <laughs> as a weapon, as a weapon to create new narratives. Right? I'm based here at Harvard, I'm a professor here, and I could not be more grateful to do the work that I do. Part of the work of culture is to get us to see past our blind spots. Increasingly today, we are reading the world through pictures. We all have a level of visual literacy that is informing how we make meaning of what's around us. Why should art and culture matter for justice? What does it say about our norms and our laws that we need to count on culture to perform a kind of work to get us to see each other anew? This is really the question behind the question that drove Frederick Douglass to consider this during the Civil War, that brings us to Harvard University to have a convening to think through these ideas. The journey to honor the dignity and humanity and the fullness of human life cannot be waged without pictures. This is something I've come to understand, and this is what Frederick Douglass knew. Every time Douglass saw an image of himself taken by a photographer. It was the anti-statement to the ocean of negative images that had been fabricated to justify the slave trade. He understood that the subjectivity of the person of African descent was dependent upon the creation of a self. Douglas was a master of visual literacy. This is the most photographed American man in the 19th century. Not African-American man, photographed American man. What did he know about himself? What did he know about our need for multiple images of a representative figure like Douglas? He writes at the end of his speech that it might take over 150 years, quite humbly, he said, for someone to come along and better explain what he meant. And I'd like to believe and I know that it's a scholar like Deborah Willis who he had in mind. The only way you could have true visual literacy in the African-American tradition is if scholars assemble the works that have been created by black visual artists and make them available to us. Deborah Willis is um, peerless in terms of plumbing the archive and preserving what you might call African-American ways of seeing. But I believe that Sarah Lewis tried to do is, is to inform the uh, contemporary world a new, new way of thinking about looking at images. How do we connect the 19th century to 21st century artists? Our perceptions have changed as a result of the work of artists and culture. An image that creates an epigraph for that idea to my mind, is the virally disseminated image taken by White House photographer Pete Souza of this young boy, Jacob Philadelphia. He wants to know, is my hair texture really the same as yours? This young boy needs evidence that he too can be the commander in chief, that he too can be the president. American citizenship has long been a project of vision and justice. It launched a project, a laboratory of initiatives, a civic curriculum, a convening. 
I think the convening is the 3D living embodiment of all that's implied in the premises of vision and justice. It's bringing the, the special issue to life. Building community and sharing community and family is justice. People from different fields, but people who are all committed to the goal of seeing justice, seeing love in public. This is life-changing, this is life-giving work. Having the visual and the verbal vocabulary to be able to read the world around me and understand why I see what I see, and to have the tools to tell my own story, I think is really important. What's the persuasive efficacy of a picture today? Do they harden your beliefs or stereotypes about other groups? Or can they persuade you to see the world differently? I do hold out the belief that the kind of productive stillness that we've seen in response to the aperture issue, the way in which it does stop people in their tracks, is a way forward and lets me retain my belief in the work of photography. Pictures work and they let us get to work. This is an extension of the work of W.E.B. Du Bois at Harvard. He took his knowledge through his engagement with the African American community to reshape the way we saw ourselves, but also the way we saw our responsibility to do important works. I think vision and justice is very much in that legacy. When I saw vision and justice, immediately I thought, ah, another monument in the history of great anthologies. Precisely because images have been used to oppress us for so long. We have to know that history and then know the history, the geniuses among us who have implicitly fought back against those negative images and explicitly insisted on representing black ways of seeing the world. That's why I think this convening is a brilliant idea. So I want to thank, really, here, Henry Louis Gates, Jr., for the work that you've done in creating the architecture for the field of African American culture and history and centralizing the arts in that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> when Frederick Douglass gave that speech during the Civil War and then redrafted it three times over the course of his life about the importance of pictures for justice, he was doing so here in Boston, across the river, and the audience was surprised and confused by it. He, in the speech, also mentioned that he felt that pictures had a power akin to song, to ballads, to performance. So I'd like for us to begin today by thinking about the work of Culture for Justice with two extraordinary individuals who are in the world of theater and music in conversation with our outstanding leader who has allowed us to consider the function of culture for justice here at Harvard. Those individuals are Diane Paulus, who is our Terry and Bradley Boom Artistic Director of the American Repertory Theater here at Harvard. Drew Gilpin Faust, President Emerita of Harvard University and the Arthur Kingsley Porter <laughs> Professor. We have musicians here. Dan Nimmer, who'll be on the piano, Torian Reddick on drums, Philip Norris on bass, and 
of course, Wynton Marsalis, a man who needs no introduction here at Harvard, is inimitable, irreplaceable. Yes, he has won many awards, but I think the largest gift here has been allowing us to consider this very topic anew. So we'll begin with a performance and then a conversation. Thank you.
Spread yourself. Go. Oh. Oh. Huh. So much. Dan Nimmer. Tori Reddick. Philip Norris. It's two of my young people from Juilliard Jazz. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You worked on that song this morning. I thought I'd begin by taking off from something that Sarah just said, which was the broadening of the notion of vision and, and justice to include arts beyond the simply visual arts and to think about performance. And yesterday ended with a kind of embodiment of that in Carrie, uh, Weems, Carrie Mae Weems' performance in Vijay's music. But I thought I'd ask these two extraordinarily practitioner, articulate practitioners of the arts to think about their fields and moving a little bit beyond the, the notion of the visual arts. Winton said when he was giving his lectures here um, several years ago, he once said in, in the middle of one of those lectures, I hope you remember this quotation, music is the art of the invisible. And Diane was saying to me this morning that one of her mentors talked about theater as making the invisible visible. Mm -hmm. So if we could just start by having each of you reflect a little bit on how you see your particular art practice fitting into the notions of um, bringing culture into citizenship and advancing the notion of justice. So Diane, maybe we'll start with you since Winton may need to catch his breath a little bit. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, well earned. Um, I think, uh, to be in the presence of that just makes us understand the possibility of art. And, and uh, thinking about yesterday and all the ideas and the uh, complicated conversation and what uh, something Carrie Mae Weems said about how do we get out of the deadlock and push ourselves into the dynamic future. So for me, Theater is always about the impossible becoming possible. And how can we as artists create space for that, create an environment uh, of risk? Uh, and, and because we were just in the presence of improvisation, which I said to Drew this morning, my, one of my great mentors was Paul Sills whose mother was Viola Spolin, who founded uh, the improvisational theater movement. And she, if you don't know her, created what we know in the theater is uh, the Bible of theater games. 
And she did it at the turn of the century uh, it, it, around the Hull House movement in Chicago because she wanted to find ways for children across language barriers to just release and free themselves. So improvisation was designed through play to get beyond. And she would literally create games on the spot overnight to release particular kids. Like she made up games. And so we think of improvisational theater in the, in the theater. That became Paul Sills was her son. He was my teacher. Uh, and then we think about that growing into Saturday Night Live, Second City, but really at its root, it was about the impossible be becoming possible, the invisible becoming visible. So uh, that links to the root of theater for me, which is transformation. And when we come together in space, like we are at a convening, how do we enter a, a, a realm of transformation? And that can't be done alone. And so that's why I particularly love the theater, and I'm sort of riffing off of visual literacy to other three-dimensional forms of literacy and bodies and space and a viscerality of how do we live in the world, Darren, where we are stuck and angry, but how do we somehow continue to retain a hope? And the hope lays, lies in the, in the hope for transformation, which I think for theater is, is the basis of our form. And you, you um, fix on a theme here that I think is also very much a part of Winton's lectures, which is art as creating community and the community of performance as well as the community of reception. Your, your thoughts on, on all this? I think it was, it was interesting what Diane was saying. You know, I'm, uh, theater is so complete mm -hmm. as an art form. Like theater can have music, it can have dance. It's like the old Greek kind of concept of the chorus and community. People knew the stories, people participated in the, in the reinvigoration of the community through mm -hmm. repetition of the, of the fundamental values and it, uh, it, it's such a fantastic, uh, for the arts, it includes everything, mm -hmm. more than music. Even though I was a musician, of course, you know, we, we love our form. As a trumpet player, we love the trumpet. <laughs> but if, we, if we, 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 we get away from our form and think of all the arts, I think it was interesting, you mentioned, you mentioned the Hull House. Yeah. Just an interesting story about jazz and where our music was. You know, our music was, of course, born of an integration in a town where people hated each other, but we had three castes. So we had whites, Creoles, and blacks. Mm. And Jelly Roll Martin said in his Library of Congress recordings that if he would work in the, in the red light district, or if he were in places of ill repute, everybody was there. <laughs> he said, and of course, nobody was putting on airs or anything because they were all there to pursue things they shouldn't have been there <laughs> to pursue. So there was a measure of equality born of vice. Yes. <laughs> and he observes that. But I grew up in the, in, the 19, in the 1970s, and you know, we were, were very segregated. I played in the funk bands mainly, but my father was a jazz musician, and his concept was much more integrated than mine. And he grew up actually in segregation. He was, he was 27 years old, or 26 years old, 27, before he could ride on a before he could ride on the front of a bus. Not that he rode on the front of the bus when he was 27. He might have waited until he was 32 to do it. But he, our, our generation was more soul trained for black folks, um, American bandstand for white people. So we played gigs for blacks, you know, and there were white gigs and black gigs. So um, we were in a strange way much more segregated even though there was possibility for integration, it's not something that we really sought out as black power. We had our, our dashikis, our afros, our platform shoes, and we had the whole, I used to have my uniform on every day. So I always go back to that time because I just like to talk about the kind of passing of generations, and I'm just gonna tell one story about our music and how the arts creates space uh, for, and how, in terms of our art, we actualize the future of the thing. And that actualization of the future of it is the symbolism of it. Mm -hmm. So I went, I was at a, a, I was giving an award to Dizzy Gillespie. And then I was maybe 22 years old. And, and Benny Goodman was there to give an award to Martin Gould. And Milt Hinton, the great bassist, 
a black bass, bass player. They, they all have passed away now. He was there. I had known Milt Hinton since I was in high school. He's a great photographer and one of the great bassists of all times, nick, nicknamed The Judge. Played on more records than any person. He was an early figure in the, in the integration of jazz. So I was uh, saying something disparaging about Benny Goodman being the king of swing. Oh man, you know white folks, the king of swing. <laughs> <laughs> I was in my thing, okay, which I unapologetically into it. That's, that's where, I'm, where I'm at. And Milt Hinton, who was a very soft-spoken person, very, uh, very positive, always, always positive, like a rock. He looked at me and he said, do you know who Benny Goodman was? I said, man, come on. He said, you need to find out. Now, just him addressing me that way let me know it wasn't a joke. You know, I spent a lot of time clowning him. So I went and I looked up who, who, what was his relationship to Milt Hinton. They were both a part of the Hull House experiment in the 1920s in Chicago. Mm. They were teenagers together in the same high school. Wow. Uh, Milt Hinton had studied with a bassist of the Chicago Symphony and Benny Goodman had studied with a clarinetist. Mm. So I did the math. Mm. I said, okay, there's two people that have known each other since 1923. Now it's 1984, 83. So what do they think about me and what I think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in a strange way that you think the civil rights, because if you, if you were born after the civil rights movement, you feel that every black person before 1965 was in slavery. Like you don't, you don't, you, you don't know the history. You have no idea of, you know, y'all was all slaves before us. <laughs> and I think that uh, just that moment was a symbolic it's the symbolism of it, 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 the strength of the bond between the two of them was deeper than the racial, and it was him telling me. Now, if you take today, mm. with that same basis, Milt Hinton, one night I went to his home, it was right, right before he passed away, and I had three bases with me, young bases. He was not supposed to get out of the bed. I don't, this was maybe 15 years ago. And when he saw the bass players, Rodney Whitaker, who runs the jazz program at Michigan State, Reginald Veal, fantastic genius, uh, of a bass player, Walter Blanding. When he saw the musicians, Carlos Enriquez, the young bass player at that time from the Bronx was driving on a permit. He was driving us, he wasn't supposed to be driving. <laughs> he had a gig after that meeting with Shaka Khan in Madison Square Garden. And I'm only saying this to say about the community, we went to see Milt and, and Mona, Milt's wife, she said, well, Milt, Milton cannot get out to bed. When Milton saw those bass players, he got up. He started pulling basses out. <laughs> played his bass, had them play bass, he literally started to cry to hear the quality of their playing. Now the two musicians that just played with Dan and I, we've been playing together, Dan and I, for years, even though Dan still looks like a baby. <laughs> Phil Norris and TJ, they're 19, 20 years old. They learned that song we played just before we came on here. Sarah saw us going over the tune. I, and this is a true story and I'm gonna stop, stop talking, but in the car last night, we drove from New York after a concert from one o'clock to 4.30 or something in the morning. So I was thinking, what should we play tomorrow? So I had whistled a tune into my phone and we were just sitting there talking, man, what should we play? So Dan was saying, well, let's play this, let's nah, 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 nah. And, and Dan said, man, we should play a minor blues in six. That's what I had whistled into my phone. So I said, man, check this out. And I put it on my phone and whistled. It was a minor blues in six, that's what we just played. <laughs> so Phil did not know the song. <laughs> TJ did not know the song. We got here late, we started to rehearse the tune, and they play, the way they played it was not like we went over it. Right. But that's the beauty of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's what you were talking about. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. So, you know, and, and if you look at the space, TJ is from Florida, Phil is from North Carolina, Dan is from Milwaukee, I'm from New Orleans, I'm in my fifties. Phil is in, in his, teens, early 20s, Dan is in his, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> his 30s. And uh, you know, it's that same spirit that was in Benny Goodman. It's the symbolic metaphor of us playing and then also the seriousness of what we're playing. Mm -hmm. I told my young people before we came out, you have to show young people that it's not a crime to be serious. Mm -hmm. Be serious, it doesn't mean we don't joke and clown, we're joking mm -hmm. before we came out here about I'm giving them D's and F's because somebody pulled their cell phone out. You're getting a D, son. <laughs> You know, but when it's time to start playing, so you know it's the same. It's interesting, just the kind of relationship we all have. 
Pretty tough act to follow that with a question, right? You're such a fabulous storyteller, but I think of a story that um, embodies something both of you have fi fixed on again, which is history came right in here, right? Hull House and <laughs> Benny Goodman, and you both have done a lot of your artistic work in historical contexts. And you're about to do 1776. You did the whole set of plays on the Civil War, sponsoring them and directing some of them at ART. History's played a very big role in your practice. And when your lectures here were really a kind of introduction to the history of jazz and music in America and its intersection with race. And I remember very vividly, you once very kindly invited me to come to a rehearsal at Jazz at Lincoln Center. And you were doing a piece with the orchestra. And you got up and before you even started to play a note, you talked about how this piece had been performed in New Orleans and the context of the time and the city and what it meant within the history of the city. And I was so stunned by that as part of a rehearsal of a jazz orchestra. I loved it, of course, being a historian but it was a history class that you gave to the orchestra. Could you talk a little bit about how you think about the role of history in art in the service of justice? Because you both talked about moving forward and envisioning an unimagined future, but you root it in a past in, in the way both of you approach your work. Well, I've been thinking about 1776, and, and by the way, Sarah, that that trailer, could I borrow it? <laughs> um, anyway, if, 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 if you don't know, 1776 is a musical about the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, I didn't know the show. It, it won the Tony Award in 1969, which is when it was written. It beat out hair, which seems impossible, that anything could be better than hair. Um, and, and what's so interesting, vis-a-vis -vis the conversations we've been having yesterday and this morning, uh, th this idea of blind spots and counter narratives. Uh, so, because I didn't know the show, I started asking people, "What about this show? Is it, you know, do you know it? Is it good?" And so many people said, "Oh, it's this most amazing musical because, of course, you know how it ends. They sign it, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's the it's the drama that's building up, and they're fighting, and then when the bells ring, the show ends, and the bells ring, you're flooded with emotion." So I, I went and I looked at it, and I, I read it. I didn't know it. I read the libretto, and I, and I get to the end of it. And all of a sudden, there's this debate in the last 10 pages of the musical about the slavery clause that Thomas Jefferson has written that Rutledge, who was the representative from South Carolina, wants out. Otherwise, he won't sign de the Declaration of Independence. And, and the idea in the musical, which is riffing on history, is that they're going to revolt from the tyranny of England, but they need a vision statement, right? I'd never thought about the Declaration of Independence. You know, you just, I don't know, we get it, we go to July 4th, we say it in, in, in grade school, but I never thought about the Declaration of Independence as, as a document that was, was a, a manifesto for the founding of the country. And they decided that it had to be a consensual ratification of this document. So they had to have union among the 13 colonies. So they're debating, they're debating. There's a big song where Rutledge sings from molasses to rum, very intense song. And in the end, for the sake of unity, they take it out. So I'm reading this, and I'm, I, I did not know this about this moment of America, and I'm thought, this must be, you know, musical theater license. This is great drama they've put into the document. So I go into my, you know, rabbit hole of internet, and of course, there it is. There's a PBS documentary about it. I'm reading Jill Lepore's book. She's talking about it. And so I thought, A, as an artist today, this makes me want to do the musical because I want to bring this into space and talk about it and um, talk about patriotism and look at this moment of the founding fathers and say, but who was not included? What compromise did we make? And for me, when those bells are ringing at the end of the show, it's sort of like the great American tragedy or the reckoning that we're still living. And so, um, and I have to say, thank you, Alexandra Bell, who was here yesterday. I, I went into my 
little dive of New York Times history on the show. And I went back, it was revived in 2006, and then it was the, the, as a concert, and the big major revival was 1997. And I went to read the reviews, and none of the reviews of these two performances of the show mention this aspect of the show. So it, it just made me think again, what do we not see? I mean, when I read it, I thought, this is the reason to do the show. And then I did read, you know, the, the, the paper of record who talked about this molasses to rum, and they described the song as the, a sinister account of slavery. And just listening to yesterday, I thought, when is it not a sinister account of slavery? I was like, like, get my black Sharpie, I'm gonna mark that out. How about saying the truthful account of slavery? So anyway, I, I think, and, and again, I, I just have to quote one thing because I, I read this and, and Brian Stevenson, we'll be hearing from him tonight, but he, he said, um, this is a quote, people do not want to admit wrongdoing in America because they expect only punishment. I'm not interested in talking about American history because I want to punish America. I want to liberate America. And that, that was just something I thought, if I could just approach that in this musical, um, that, that's, that's why I get up in the morning, right? That's why we work till four in the morning. That's why we do what we do. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't really have anything to add. I, I just think, uh, you know, one, one thing that's good when you, when you get a chance to be around colleagues of, this, uh, of such a high caliber, and uh, it, it's such a blessing, you know, to sit here with you, I'm reading your books, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you, you know, all of your, your achievements, how much it's cost you over time. Yeah. And at whatever level you go to, the type of study you put in, the type of seriousness, just what you just, what you just described, I mean, there's, not, there's nothing for me to add to that, except to just say, yeah. <laughs> yeah and I think with, with Brian, I, you know, it's a, it's a shock. I was with him, he started playing the piano and could play. Mm. Was playing tunes, you don't know what love is, and was, I was like, man, you can play? He can do that too. He was like, yeah, man. <laughs> he said, I can play, man. And I said, let me record this to make sure that it's real, and it's real. <laughs> So you know you're quoting him, and I mean it's just a, yeah, it's, it's just the, the reason we, we go into the past and the reason that you, like you, I, I've told you before, there was a, there was a quote in your, in your book where you talked about the aspirations and dreams of, of people on the body of an eight-year-old. I forget the exact age of the, of, the, of the person. And all the years I thought about slavery, I, I never thought about that. I like what you're saying about you. you know, I never, so we're always enlightened. Last night we did a thing in our hall with Kim Burns about country music. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about, Ken was talking about, and we were rehearsing for the show. And the, the guys in the band know I'm normally very frantic before rehearsal because we have to really be organized with a lot of parts, a lot of new arrangements. I was very calm. They said, well, why are you so calm? I said, well, Kim Burns is going to be here. <laughs> and when he walks in here, that's going to be 70% improvement in the organization of everything. <laughs> And I, I go back to a lecture I went to that he gave in 1987. So I go back those years, and I, I went to meet him after that lecture, and I, I hugged him and dapped him and talked about how great he was. Now, here we are, mm -hmm, years old. <laughs> and it's, it's still a respect and love I have for just his, his brilliance and his genius. And one person who played is Marty Stewart hmm. from Mississippi. And you know Mississippi, Louisiana, we, you know, was not as bad as us in Texas, but it's, <laughs> we gotta, but, but I, I love him. And I said, when I had my septet, we, I was in my early 30s, he came on our bus and drove with us somewhere, <laughs> Marty Stewart, and he gave me a book on country music. Mm. And last night he played a piece that DeFord Bailey played for the Grand Ole Opry that sounds like a train called Pan American. It was unbelievable, on the mandolin. Mm. So all the cats in the band were looking. I said, see, that's Marty telling us, I can play, man. <laughs> and uh, I just think that we have such a, such a, you know, such a, such a, we have to return to our history over and over again because we, we, are, we are our history. And we don't return to it to regurgitate it. Mm -hmm. We turn to it to, to, to revivify, to, to, that's all there is to do. It's, a, it's only a cycle. We're going to live, we're going to die. We're not going to skirt those. We're born and we're going to die. Mm -hmm. So for us to, how many people have read the Declaration of Independence? How many have know us in the Constitution? 
How many understand how important it is for us to participate? How many have had the truth of American life put in a context? Instead, we just bring the shiny suit out mm -hmm. and we get a slogan or we take some clothes off and we have a slogan about something that's the opposite of our actions. Mm. So, you know, just we, we, we have to constantly return to those, those fundamental values in another way, mm -hmm. but never run from what is hard. I tell my students, why do people not rehearse these tunes? It's hard. Why does somebody not know how to play on chord changes? It's difficult. Mm -hmm. Why do we not write counterpoint? It's hard to learn that. Why do we want to solo ourselves and never listen to another person? Because we want to hear ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, we can just yeah. go down the list of the directions we go in. Why do we not do some work? It's hard to do this work. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to constantly say. Let's do this work, or let's be for real. Yeah. Let's, yeah. And that's. Absolutely. That's what you're about. I'm honored to be here with you. Thank you. Winton, those remarks underscore the fact that you are both teachers and your artistic practice is a practice of performance, but it's also a practice of pedagogy. You obviously through the um, theater dance media program with students and, and then in programs in schools. Winton, you're at Juilliard, but you also perform in schools regularly and get involved with kids. How do you think about that as part of the artistic mission of change and, and the future? And, and how, I mean, when you've spoken and written so forcefully about how we are neglecting art in the schools, and uh, you've pointed out a golden age of sorts when there was a lot of art education in the schools in the early 20th century and some amazing number of pianos sold every right, year, right, like 300,000 pianos sold every right. year. How, how do we think about, if we're, we're thinking of the mission of art and justice, mm -hmm. what we could do, what we must do in terms of mm -hmm. education in the arts and beyond? Mm -hmm. I think uh, pedagogy is something we have to do all the time, not just in a classroom. So if you're a, like you're talking, you're, you're doing it with your bandmates. Right. I mean, right. right, we're doing it all the time. We're doing it with every audience we interact with. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm deeply committed to that because I think we need to take time. We need to take time to talk about what we're doing. And I think there's a, you know, the, I came of age in, the 90s as a young artist and th there was a sense of okay you know the arts are this thing and it's up on a pedestal and if you don't get it you know that's your problem and I just entered entered the world thinking I've got I've got to be in communication with the audience and if they it, it's not their fault if they're not coming to the theater that's my fault and and how can I redefine the dynamic with an audience how can I be in a dialogue, and I, and I had a very early board member at ART say to me, Diane, you know, your job is to be a pedagogue. You have to talk about what you're doing. And then, of course, the next step is to embody it, right? Because we can't just talk about it. We have to live it, do it. And um, I think the aspect of pedagogy that I just want to throw on, you know, the, the, into the discussion is the, the idea that when we're in pedagogy, we're asking questions. And that's been a driver to my practice, is just, you know, what are the questions we're asking? And if you're not asking a big enough question, that's when the work is mediocre. You know, you just have to keep asking a bigger question. And I, I, I had this moment at Passover last weekend, because, uh, you know, every year you go to a different Seder and you get a different Haggadah. So every Haggadah will say different things about the service. And this one I had never encountered before talked about the idea of questions. And it said, the beauty of a question is that it demonstrates we need each other. And I had never thought about it that way. That the idea of a, the very sure. act of asking a question means we must have each other. So just what you were saying about community, you know, that we're not going to figure it out. We're not going to progress. We're not going to heal. We're not going to provoke. We're not going to do any of that unless we do it together. So that's modeled in a classroom, if you, you, know, if you think about the questions you ask and what you learn. And that should be modeled in the rehearsal hall. Mm -hmm. 
You know, how do you get a performer to do something and be someone they've never been before? How do you get them asking bigger questions? Your collaborators, everyone in the room. And then that extends to the audience. I, I think, you know, once again, I mean, it's... <laughs> I mean, I will say something, but I don't have to say <laughs> I don't want to feel like I'm useless, but... No. I feel the, 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 let's just talk about the whole thing of, of, of a question. In our music, a call and response is a question. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the piece, I was hollering, yow! I yeah. wasn't supposed to even be hollering, I hollered. <laughs> so when I started hollering, yow! Then, then TJ, yow! But I had told him, my man, play some, some, do some African, you know. <laughs> Backstage, it was supposed to be his solo. So before we were walking out, I said, man, we running short on time. So as we were walking out, he said, does that mean you're cutting my solo? <laughs> Because his solo is last. Right. So, uh, so we were just talking about why the rhythm didn't work with the bass and the drums. And I gave him a demonstration just downstairs because when Philip is playing, he's going ding, 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 boom, bing, bing, ding, 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 deep inside of the bottom rhythm. When TJ is playing, he's ding, 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 ding. He's on the top rhythm. So, okay, look at Phil. This is his physicality. And this is yours. This, the drums and the bass are not going to play together. So, what is your bottom rhythm? Your bottom rhythm is boom, da, da, boom, da, da, boom, da, da. Put the top rhythm in the context of the bottom rhythm. Mm -hmm. Ding, 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 and sit down in the bottom rhythm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you see how that feels? And it's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. How do you share the space? Mm -hmm. And how is it you ask a question? And how do you find another person? Now, in our music, the rhythm section, they're two opposites. The drums is the loudest, the bass is the softest. Mm -hmm. The cymbal is the highest, the bass is the lowest. Mm -hmm. And they're forced to deal with each other, and they don't like that. <laughs> the cymbal is in six, and the bass, and the, and the, and the bass is in four. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. what, you, what, what, you, what you're saying, mm -hmm. basically, is, yeah, we, we I'm not the answer. We are. We are. And look at it. We have so many heavyweights up in here. Mm. So many people who are doing so much. I could look around. And we've known each other for such a long time. I was talking with, with Elizabeth. We were talking about Arthur Logan and Duke Ellington. I sat down. I had a dinner with Paul Simon two nights ago. We sat down. We, we are very close friends. We talk about human things, not, not argue about pop music or jazz. Mm. We went through every song Duke Ellington ever wrote. And when we got to 1962, <laughs> we said, man, the guy in 1962 wrote like 80 songs. That he was 63 years old. He had been writing songs since 1924. So we were looking at this list. And I said, damn, you know, we got to get started. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's that. It's, it's the feeling of what we are doing and how we show our students and we teach them. We, we teach them with love and we have to ask questions and let them speak and let them do their thing. But we have to, we have to be adults. Mm -hmm. Our culture has set young against old to sell stuff to young people. Mm -hmm. It has created a bad situation. Mm -hmm. It felt good for a little while, but it's not a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. It's just not. You have to back away from the concept of a generation gap, your young people as a market, exploiting their sexuality. Mm -hmm because you create a bunch of young know-it-alls. I always tell my students, you would not follow, when you're 50, you're not gonna wanna follow yourself at 19. <laughs> I, I will guarantee you that. Now, you know some things. You know some things. Yeah. But boy, the amount you don't know, because if you know all you're gonna know, you don't need to keep living. Mm. And like the old folks used to say in the country, boy, I've been your age, you ain't been mine. <laughs> so, it's just, it's just, you know, our kids, yeah. Our, our kids, they need to be loved, they need that, and they need, to, they need the freedom, but they need adults in the room. Mm. They do not need other children in the room with them. They have that get online and be with children. We need to be like, hey, this is the standard that we have. Mm -hmm. This is what being serious is about. Mm -hmm. And this is deeper than me failing you. Mm -hmm. That's why I joke about their grades. I don't give them grades. The people, to go to what you were saying, the people's judgment on you is going to be so harsh and they're not gonna tell you a word. You'll never see them again. And I always <laughs> joke that we're the only art form in the world, but you've enlightened me. Jazz musicians, we're the only ones in the world who will play sad and blame the people because they don't want to hear us. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So 
I, I agree. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Let's play better. Let's get deep into the meaning of our thing. If somebody played like Charlie Parker in here today, people will come here to play. Mm. And uh, so, mm. I talked anyway, but I didn't have to. Oh my God! <laughs> Are you kidding? So. Now I have the very hardest part of my job, which is to say we have to stop because there's so much more to do today. And I think you've seen here today a performance <laughs> of some ideas that inspire the work of these two extraordinary artists and I think that fit into the larger themes of this conference. But I also want to underscore how both of these people have, through their artistic practice, made such an extraordinary contribution to the creation of community on this campus and have asked questions that linger with us and that have brought us together and made us understand ourselves so much better. So we are the beneficiaries of the very enormous gifts that both of you embody. So please join me in thanking Diane and Lynn. Good morning. Isn't this been wonderful? It's, gosh, I could just sit there all day long and listen to uh, everybody, you know, speak so beautifully. Uh, so it's such a pleasure uh, to be here with you. My name is Moisan Mostafavi. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Design. I want to thank Alan for his welcome, um, Darren uh, for your words, Winton for the wonderful music, uh, Diane, really, for everything you're doing, and Drew for, for your insights. Um, uh, Tomiko uh, Brown-Nagin and the Radcliffe Institute, uh, really, for making this hall uh, wonderful convening possible. And of course, to uh, Larry and Adele for being here. The main question of this hall convening has been, what is the role of Arts for Justice? And of course, this next session is focusing on race, culture, and civic space, and ask how civic spaces and the arts construct narratives that let us work against injustice and work towards justice. Um, as Sarah already mentioned uh, in her remarks, when we discuss justice, often this involves the question of rights, and these rights are embedded in laws and in politics. And of course, today we are, and we have been talking about arts and culture. I think in this next session, we're hoping to expand, uh, in a way, uh, these, these parameters slightly, or to include, if I may say, the role of design as also a component as a part of this broader issue of uh, culture and its relationship to justice. At the Graduate School of Design, one of the things that I think we try to do is precisely to understand how these issues or the issue of justice is addressed as a spatial phenomenon, as a, as a kind of spatial concept. And therefore, the question for us often is, is democracy spatial? Can we talk about something which is spatial democracy? We are constantly dealing with these questions of spatial justice. And many of my colleagues, for example, Susan Feinstein has um, discussed the concept of the just city. Tony Griffin runs a lab called the Just City Lab, which does incredible work. Uh, Dan Dioka has done studios that are focused on Ferguson, on the MLK boulevards, you wouldn't believe how many boulevards there are in the United States that are named after Martin Luther King. But when you look at many of these boulevards, you find that it's really, really, really hard to find any of them that do justice to the memory of Martin Luther King in terms of the quality of the spaces that they represent. Often, these are deeply problematic uh, spaces, and in a way, we, are, we have been working on, on how to rethink the kind of quality of our public spaces 
that can do justice to the memory of Martin Luther King. We've used the rubric, the title of agonistic urbanism to really address this question of the conflictual relationships that exist in our cities and how to design in a way the future of our urban environments that are cognizant of the reality of these conflictual relationships in spatial terms. So for this morning's session, really who better to continue develop these, uh, these questions than David Ajay and Tiasta Gates, who will be in conversation with Sarah Lewis. One of the things about um, David and Tiasta, and something that's been really incredibly rewarding for me personally, is that I've known them both for a long time. David, probably from the time that he started his architectural practice in London, and he has had a lot of involvements over the years with Harvard, has taught here uh, many times, most recently as the John C. Portman design critic in architecture, has done studios with us in Africa, um, and a wonderful exhibition uh, which was about uh, African capitals, uh, the exhibition that we had uh, showed 10 African cities. And many of us are familiar with the concept of the grand tour when the architects go and went during the 18th century around Europe. In a way, I think for, 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 for David, uh, somehow this trip to Africa was also a kind of grand tour. And it was fantastic to see the photographs that he, he produced. Um, uh, I think in relation to our subject today, his first, some of his early projects, like the idea stores uh, in London, were phenomenal in terms of how they really brought the community together. And of course, more recently, his National Museum of African American History and Culture, which has been such an incredible project. But I think probably his, around here, probably his, his most important contribution is uh, to be recognized as Professor Skip Gates' favorite architect and, uh, and to be given the project of doing the Hutchins Center, which has been such a great success. Uh, similarly with uh, Theaster, I think we were so honored to have had him as one of our Loeb Fellows at the GSD in 2011. And just to see the incredible range and diversity of, of artistic practice that you've gone on uh, to develop before then and since then. Most recently, uh, Theaster has had a fantastic exhibition uh, in Basel, in Switzerland. Currently, he has an exhibition at the Palais de Tokyo. And maybe something that uh, a lot of people don't know about Theaster is that he, he has an incredible background studying planning and at the same time uh, pottery and crafts and ceramics. And it's this combination of really dealing with broad you know, territorial issues and at the same time having this amazing capacity to handle things very closely and this connection with the proximity of things has been uh, so important in his, in his uh, diverse range of practices including video, sculpture, painting, ceramics. Um, and and it's, it's really amazing what uh, contribution he's made and also his role now as an educator at University of Chicago. And of course, Sarah Lewis uh, needs uh, no introduction. It's really, I'm so, so um, grateful to Sarah for organizing this event. Thank you and bringing everyone together. We've also been lucky to have had opportunities for collaborations together most recently with uh, Professor Robin Kelsey and the team from Hookup when we had the On Monuments uh, Place, Time and Memory, which was co-organized uh, with the Harvard University Committee on the Arts and really uh, to honor uh, Drew. Uh, so it's really a, a wonderful, um, wonderful opportunity to be able to welcome uh, David, Theaster, and Sarah. Please welcome them. Thank you. So to continue in the themes from the morning's panel and session we have and these two extraordinary practitioners, the embodiment of 
what it means to be serious in one's practice, what it means to also embody the, the model of play and improvisation as well, in order to ask these fundamental questions, as Diane Paulus's comments really brought us to consider, in the work of the designer and the architect, how do we create space such that culture can inspire a new model of justice? Right. You know, uh, I've been trying to figure out how to shape the, a, a way in so that we could open this up pretty quickly. Yeah. And in my practice, when you look at the history of contemporary art or conceptual art, um, all of the action is happening within a, a form, say a painting or a sculpture, yes. and then that form is informed by some content, um, nature, the environment. Over time, I started to think about uh, could we scale the question of form so that the form was no longer just about a medium, uh, I work with fire hoses or I work but if, the, if form could be the creation of platforms, mm -hmm. and if we could create, if we could imagine that part of being artistic or part of being an, an artist was that you could take any form, say political form, the form of the city, uh, space, if you could scale form and then reimagine the form itself, mm -hmm. perhaps I wouldn't have to be so invested in the content I could kind of make a platform, mm -hmm. and then the byproduct of creating the preconditions of something great is that then when you load the form, mm -hmm. the form will always perform the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. So if you create structural racism, let's say, then it as a precondition is going to produce other things. Well, are there ways that we could create other kinds of forms? Mm -hmm. like? democratic spatial forms, mm. so that whatever happens in the Stony Island Arts Bank is super dope, it's, it's, it, it is <laughs> of a place, it always invites others in. And so I think that I try to move them back and forth between a form that fits on a wall mm -hmm. and then scaling form so that we can imagine ourselves in a larger, let's say in this case, uh, a, a, a form of togetherness. Yes, you know. yes, yes, yes. And there's a, hu a humility in also what you're, you're saying here, because this, this event is very much inspired by the platform you've already created with your convenings here and with the space of the Stony Island Arts Bank and with the extraordinary works and exhibitions that you have originated. So thank you. Thank you for that. I don't know if you've ever been to a David Ajay opening, mm -hmm. right? But So I have to create something called Black Artist Retreat. <laughs> David could simply have an opening. <laughs> It's true, it's true. And, and so it's, it's also the, the power of, of the individual mm. creative in relationship to the power of the creation of institutions and other kinds, other kinds of formats. And so there's a part of me that, David, I just want to salute you for both being the aggregator yes. and then creating these architectural forms that also gather. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I just love listening to this guy. <laughs> I know. Um, I think for me, architecture, I mean, my, my, my quest to, my question was what, my question was, was always why make form? Yeah. Mm. And that was, that was the beginning of the whole thing. I thought architecture was doing very well, beautiful things being made, sure. very nice. <laughs> <laughs> But it just struck me that, um, you know, and I love what you said about Winton and this idea of this invisible language, <laughs> that somehow there was a kind of story going on and it just was just, um, you know, I felt like I was alive, <laughs> I was living, but somehow um, I couldn't see um, the effects of my life in the world. And I sort of thought that, you know, in my, in my mind, I've sort of always thought that the kind of the point of living is to then create, to kind of be part of the kind of device that moves the clock a little bit, you know, in some kind of direction. So um, the sort of, uh, I, I just felt that somehow the idea of architecture felt like it really was operating 
And it was birthed out of this utopic idea of creating ideals. It was operating at this idea of the utopic that somehow creates a sort of form for people, but was by, by continually just sort of staying in that stratosphere, had sort of dislocated itself from the kind of evolution that was happening with the way in which cities had created new conditions, that migration, the sort of hyper-migration that had happened in the 20th century had created new metropolitan sort of compressions, and that the hybridity that was, explo was exploding out of that was just not being discussed or even a, a thought about in terms of how that can have a manifest form, which in itself, if we look at the way it, it has performed in music, in literature, in the arts, has exploded our in, sort of intellectual base of how or what it is for us to be human uh, mm -hmm. and, and to express ourselves. And so I really, I mean, and I say that as a kind of massive sort of assault on architecture, but I felt that it was just simply kind of navel gazing. <laughs> Yeah. So there, there, there are times when, um, like say if I look at the landscape of the South Side or when I spend time in Gary, Indiana or Akron, Ohio, um, and I look at a main street, and when you, you look at the violence that people talk about among black boys in Chicago, I have to ask myself, have we created the preconditions that allow young people to be just? If the, only, if the only spaces you have is a strip mall that has a Pizza Hut, a laundromat, and a Walgreens, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And no one has yeah. a job. Yeah. Is it possible within that architectural sphere, mm -hmm. within that, that space, mm -hmm. is there space for, for us to, um, to be our best selves, yeah. Yeah. right? And mm -hmm. so that utopic notion that you're yeah. mentioning, it's like the utopic requires a certain, um, theatrical space whereby we might play. Yes, yeah. And in the absence of that theatrical space for us to be our best selves, mm -hmm. all we're left with is pizza and a cash check that takes 30% of your money. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is what unites also your practice in my, in my mind. Yesterday when we were speaking with Carrie Mae Weems, um, David, you, you spoke about the beginning of your journey and considering how architecture can be a model for justice mm -hmm. as it relates to honoring human life. Mm -hmm. the, for many ways, and of course there's, as, as Winton just remarked, in 63 seems like the time to get started now. But so there's lots of work so to, to come. Yeah. <laughs> but so one great. of the incredible monuments of your work is the creation of the Smithsonian Museum to honor African American history and culture. But this is the end of a journey. In some people's minds, it's just the beginning, yeah. really, really, for you. Can you say more about what animated the beginning of that journey? No, I think that um, in architecture, there's this kind of thing about uh, a sort of fashion of saying, let's not talk about memory, <laughs> yeah. um, because we're all, yeah. all different. Yeah. And in a way, I've sort of become obsessed with this idea that actually we really need to keep talking about remembering, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, especially in form making. Yeah. And we need to understand what yeah. the form is making us remember. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, a show that I've recently sort of opened in London yes. was just explicitly to talk about this idea of um, form making as making memory, mm -hmm. as actually concretizing memory. Yes. Um, and, you know, the projects that led me to that sort of, that meditation are really, you know, of course, the Smithsonian is a kind of the, the, the sort of largest uh, formation of that, but it started with just meditations on um, a project in London for a, a, a young man who wanted to be an architect who was brutally murdered in a racist incident in London, um, a, a, a young boy called Stephen Lawrence. And it was one of my first projects mm. in the UK um, that I was commissioned to make. And, and I was asked by the family to make a piece of architecture that at the same time was an education center, but also was somehow a memorial to the memory of their son. Um, and that was the first moment where I suddenly realized, oh my God, the built environment and architecture mm. and memory are inextricably connected, even mm. at the mundane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this idea that somehow, you know, in a way, now constructing architecture that is not necessarily about saying that um, everything is, you know, bad, but is about saying things have to change yeah. and yeah. setting up models which offer typological opportunities of transformation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems to be the most paramount thing to do in the beginning of the 21st century. Mm. But, you know, but David, yeah. when, when, we're, when we're designing space in our cities, I doubt if a commitment to memory and dignity is part of the call for general contractors. 
right? You know, I haven't met one yet. You know, <laughs> and, and that, and that, in these moments where we're thinking mostly about value engineering, we're very rarely. If you don't know that word. That's a violent you know, word or, in you my know, business. You know how to how to <laughs> how to make the project as efficient as possible. Then we throw vision out out the door, mm. so that when Moisen talks about um, the, the Martin Luther King uh, boulevards, you know when you when you think about the MLK boulevards all over the country, what they lack is vision, mm. and then it and it and it demonstrates that there's there's been. Um, if not an intentional assault, a systematic refusal mm -hmm. to allow for the, the, the possibility of beauty to permeate our cities fully. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that in your practice, practice especially, but also in the things I'm trying to do, it's just like, can we just show how a commitment and care to the things of poor people could actually dramatically change the way one wants to live. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in both of your work, you see a reclamation as a way, a reclamation of objects, a reclamation of space, as a way to reconsider value. Is this, is this also a way forward? Can you say more about what animates that desire? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think, I think that it is a way to create um, a, a citizenship that feels that it has ownership in the construction of its world. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is critical yeah. in that. There is, you know, in the way that we, we feel a certain kind of ownership when we put on the clothes that we like, yeah. <laughs> somehow the environment that we inhabit, also feeling like we are producers of that is, is, is incredibly critical. Yeah. And that, that the narrative in the production of those spaces also is shifting. Mm. It is learning, but it's also shifting. Mm. I mean, I just think that there's so much, I think that there's so much has happened in the hundred years of the kind of population explosion and the, what the 20th century has done that's gonna inform so many hundred years that we're just even, we're just starting to understand what it means to come together so tightly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually has, re, it's, it has changed everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we all now, kind of have to live together. <laughs> so we have to negotiate our identities and our spaces in a very fundamentally new way. And I think it's our generation's responsibility to kind of enact that in every single art form Absolutely. as a kind of you know, device for the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if I think about n not the objects that I make, but if, if we were to kind of take a step back to look at the back room, there's probably two big ideas governing me. One is like, my mama's Christianity, which um, words like salvation and redemption, mm -hmm. they were very important words and kind of very important metaphors for uh, what happens when a person dies. Um, can they be redeemed? C could they be resurrected? Mm -hmm. And if resurrected, what kind of power necessary mm -hmm. in that resurrection? Mm -hmm. And then if once dead, then resurrected, what does that do for people around, right. right? And I think that when you take spaces that have been abandoned for a long time, you, you, you don't tear the building down, mm. you redeem the building. Mm. You, you, you demonstrate in plain view mm -hmm. that the thing could be something better than it had been. Mm -hmm. And that when people witness that redemption, uh, people feel like a small miracle may have just happened, mm. right? So yeah. let's say that redemption and salvation is on one side of the practice and the other is like Shintoism, that, that there might be kami, there might be life, there's life inside of that wood. Since there's life inside that tree, why would you ever tear that tree down, right? And if you have to tear the tree down, can you respect the God power in the tree such that the way that you tear it is with such ethos and thoughtfulness? And if a person is strung out, that there's God in a person, if a building is unredeemed, that the land seems like an empty lot, that perhaps these are once sacred spaces and that our job is to re-sacralize, is, mm. is, is to help others recognize the power, spirit, kami in the thing, that that thing then, then might shine. Mm. I, I just have to kind of follow a little bit of that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it's so telling that black people and spirituality are in this incredible, mm -hmm. constant reinvention. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it's, it's beautiful that you remembered Shintoism, but the Yoruba mm -hmm. canon or the Akan canon yeah. mm -hmm. is all about the anima, the yes. spiritual yes. of everything. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, it really t it took me going to Japan and sort of sitting in Kyoto for a year and a half to realize that yeah. that thing that I was obsessed with in Japan was kind of what I was brought up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, oh. Mm -hmm. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And this idea of a kind of respect for, you know, the spirituality that I think you see mutated into Christianity as, as a, absorbed through Christianity that black folk sort of demonstrate is this kind of belief in the kind of vitality of the world and everything in it, right. animate and inanimate. That's and I think it's kind of part of the way in which, and if you look at the, the arts of the continent, I think it's also part of the way in which we believe that the, the, the physical world needs to be constructed, That's which is a right. counter difference. It's a kind of respect of certain ideas that have to be kind of manifest to create a certain kind of set of possibilities or shrines or spaces that allow us to feel like, all right, we're manifesting yeah. who we are in the world, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, you know, I think it, that's part of the kind of way which we, yeah. we yeah. Yeah. I remember the first time I went to see your building in DC mm -hmm. and um, I didn't have a special hookup to get in the building. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had to wait in line with everybody else, <laughs> you know? And, and there were, there were um, school buses and chartered vehicles, chartered buses, and uh, people's family reunions were happening at the, you know what I'm saying? Shrine. On the Smithsonian, yeah. right? And they were coming to, they were coming to see the, their, their history. They were coming to see blackness, right? And then you could just stand in line and just watch people witness the architectural image and you could, you, could, you could see that they were their best selves because mm -hmm. they were proud of the image in front of them. Mm -hmm. And that, and that mm -hmm. when you think about vision, right? When you, when you, and, so, and, and so people would just, you, you could just hear it over and over again. I'm just so glad to be here. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad mm -hmm. to be here, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It is, it's extraordinary. Yeah. Being called to be your best self through the prompt of space. Yeah. This is really what unites the two of you. The experiences that my students had in Vision and Justice were, were to come to DC to see your museum and to have a talk from you, Theaster, mm -hmm. right? And in both cases, the space itself changed. This is, <laughs> these classes, of course, end on the hour. And once uh, Theaster finished speaking, they, they didn't get up. They had class. They didn't get up, and Theaster had to say, OK, that's it. <laughs> Everyone leave, because they were so understanding of that moment of being able to redeem space through an intentionality, through your practice. And in that moment, I think, felt charged to consider work anew. Yeah. In going to DC, there, we had that same experience. We did have the hookup, thanks. To you, but of course, being in line, <laughs> it's like that. But be, being in line did really even change their very posture, changed mine, changed us all. Can you tell us, tell us a bit also about the sighting of not just the museum, but our bodies within that museum? Yeah. No, I mean it was when, when we won the competition, and they were the most incredible people. You know, the people that you've admired. So there was Oprah and Colin Powell and Dick Parsons, and yeah. Yeah. you know, the, all the gangs. Sort of. oh. And, and, you know, um, Congressman Lewis, you know. Um, and it was a kind of moment where um, I suddenly realized that actually, you know, what made us get the project, and it wasn't conscious, was that we'd understood that there was something more than just making a museum, more than just making a building on the mall, but it was also, it was also a memorial, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it was also a shrine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the shrine requires that you don't, you don't even need to go inside. The shrine just requires that you just need to get near it yeah. to feel that you, it kind of it validates mm -hmm. your, your mm -hmm. vibration, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And when I was kind of you know, meditating on working on the forum, this, you know, I, I looked at so many things and I kept drawing, 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 until I saw these images of the shrines of the Yoruba. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it just, uh, it just suddenly made sense mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that actually the DNA of, you know, of this kind of human muscle of mm -hmm. always kind of the ritual of narratives that we need to kind of encapsulate. Um, mm -hmm. Once you kind of remove what you think is about, you know, the juju or the spirit or the negatives, <laughs> and you look at the reality of what the human experience is kind of meta, sort of metamorphosizing, concretizing in form, you realize that this is actually a, a critical part of how we are, and definitely a critical part of what West Africa was in terms of its evolution and civilization. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. David, if I could, if I could um, put the juju back, <laughs> or, 
if, I, oh. if, I, if we put the juju right back, let's, get to let's say that, that, <laughs> that, that, that part of what's also exciting to me about shrines and temples mm. is that they, they give back to you what you put in. Exactly. Mm. So let's say if, if you go with belief, mm. you might get healed. Yeah. Right? And that, and that the, the, when I, I've been thinking a lot about both these questions, Sarah, about what kind of what vision and justice means. What does it mean to make an artwork? Like, you know, I started working with these um, discontinued fire hoses. Initially, I was interested in like a, a question about them in relationship to civil rights, but then it was kind of like them in relationship to painting. Mm -hmm. But I always felt like I, I couldn't complete the story, that I needed people to kind of give energy back, back to the thing. And, and I wonder, with justice, there's both what we expect a government to do or a, a school like Harvard to do or what we expect policy to do. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the, the beauty and the power of justice is that it also requires the effort of others, right. that we have to also bring our belief to justice, mm -hmm. we have to bring our belief to humanity, mm -hmm. we have to bring our belief to the arts, and that, that if those things were to meet, that, it, that there's no government sanction that could help people be better people. But there, are, but there are conditions by which you can encourage people to be their best selves, and if they meet those things, so when I'm in Japan and people line up at a train station, it's like, I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> you know, there's not, there's not a policing of that thing, but there's something ab ab about the, um, the expectation that comes from governance or a power, and then the social expectations that one makes that create a kind of harmony that allows trains to be on time. And so sometimes I imagine brothers on the street standing in line waiting on a bus, you know? And I imagine like, man, what a radical view of the South Side if we were all like this. <laughs> That, that may, I, I have so much belief that, that, um, it's, that justice requires our deep commitment. You know, I was telling Danielle Allen that her book, um, Talking with Strangers, that this idea that even if we don't get along, that we could have political friendship, hmm. that, that we, could, we could agree that a site is sacred, we could, we could agree gangs could have truces, you know, that th th there could be a moment where you say, okay, if we all believe that our children should be safe, mm -hmm. let's agree that no violence would incur in this place. Right. You know what I mean? And that, and that the political friendship um, might also become a, a social friendship. It might lead, in fact, to real friendship. But I'm totally fine with the fact that the brother across the street who wants to sell weed is going to do what he's going to do and I'm gonna have my little art thing across the street. But brother and I have to talk to each other. And I'm like, look, man, you know, and I think that the truth of our streets, the, the, truth of the, the truth of the complexity of when you try to land a thing in black space so that it might be radical, mm -hmm. it means that you gotta talk with strangers. And you gotta say, look, we may not be on the same page today, mm -hmm. but like there are people who are coming to this space who care about you mm -hmm. and could be future friends. Please don't harm them. Yes. Please, please be your best self. And that the architectural image of the bank helps them go, yo, blood, I got you, man. Mm -hmm. I, you know, mm -hmm. I got you. And, and I think that if we continue to make, uh, if democracy requires that there are not just beautiful places in the Acropolis, in the downtown, mm -hmm. that there also has to be beautiful places in the hood. That's right. That's that we right. can't have our best buildings somewhere else. I also have the difficult task here <laughs> of having to, to close an extraordinary conversation in order to allow for the other speakers to come to the stage. But I think we've seen here that a conversation about what it means to be our best self, for everyone to have a right, for their full flourishing requires the animating force of architecture, but also the reclamation through the arts 
of what we often don't want to redeem but must. So thank you both for your extraordinary work and the questions that you prompted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you all doing? It's really extraordinary to be here, to be participating in something that's this tapestry um, to which we're all contributing our few threads as the day goes on, the many hours yesterday, the many hours today. Thank you all for being here with. Let us begin with a photograph of two women. One of them is in profile, her eye lowered. The other, her face halved by that profile, looks directly forward. They both wear close-fitting black wig caps. Their resemblance is evident. The same slight arch of eyebrow, the mouths that seem to be halves of the same mouth a mother and daughter. Let's go on to another photograph. On a street stands a two-story house that has given up on being a house. Its facade has staved in the surface, is splintered timber and a scatter of plaster, each section like a variation on the theme of ruin. All this disorder is contained within the rectangular house-like shape. Brick columns indicate the roof line. On the left, there remains a white door intact and the three steps that lead up to it. It must all once have been some families, no more. And then let's look at one more photograph. If you look down the river from the upper section of Braddock Avenue, you see a landscape entirely altered by heavy industry. The Edgar Thompson Steelworks was Andrew Carnegie's first mill. With the other mills in the area now shut down, it is also his last. The industrial landscape on which it sits is interrupted by plumes of smoke and looks blasted and forlorn, like a medieval battlefield or futuristic dystopia. And right next to the mill to the west and north is the town of Braddock proper a grid of single-family homes and empty plots, only a few miles away from downtown Pittsburgh. We can go back to the first image. The body, the street, the town, these ever-widening circles of concern are from the work of Latoya Ruby Frazier, who's from Braddock and is one of the most extraordinary American photographers currently at work. Until she got hold of a disposable camera in high school, her great passion was drawing and watercolor. In the shadow of the Edgar Thompson Steelworks, Frazier began to, make, to take photographs. Her most sustained early subjects were herself, her mother, and her grandmother. Unposed photographs of the family, double portraits, interior scenes, incredibly good at an incredibly young age. She portrayed, too, the vulnerability and ill health of her family members, unflinching images that convey that what is shameful is not the body that suffers, but rather the systems that assail the body with violence. B Frazier left Braddock at 16 and went to Edinburgh University in Pennsylvania, where she learned a great deal more about the technical possibilities of photography. She would go on to an MFA from Syracuse. In her book, The Notion of Family, published when she was 32 and already considered a contemporary classic, she used a number of different photographic approaches to create a conversation with history. This part of Braddock called the bottom because of its low elevation within its undulating terrain, but the name also fits because of its extreme deprivation, is where Frazier grew up. A century ago, about 20,000 people lived there. Today, that number is closer to 2,000. There are revitalization efforts, but the town still bears its scars. Empty plots, abandoned homes, shuttered businesses, frequent fires. 
Braddock is sometimes called a ghost town. I went to Braddock for a couple of days, even though Fraser no longer lives there, because I like to go to a place to understand better what I'm looking at. Before going, I had looked up recent news about the town. Most of it was grim. Braddock's man guilty plea in shooting death. Braddock man charged with burglarizing home. But at the bottom of the page was an item from September 2015. Braddock artist wins MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. And so this remarkable woman was inscribed into her hometown's history. As her work developed, Frazier was especially alert to the history of the photographs that had been made in the Pittsburgh area. She said, there were these photographers, men like Lewis Hine, Walker Evans, W. Eugene Smith, and Lee Friedlander, who had made work about the steel mills. They were all men shooting from an outside point of view. But taking on the same material could never lead to the same results for her. So she worked in a spiral, beginning at home, then moving into the street, and finally in a rented helicopter up in the air. And in all these images, she established a continuity, a sense of surface complexity and crisp visual description. The work, when it came to its proper maturity, earned her numerous museum exhibitions and a number of prestigious awards, including that grant from the MacArthur Foundation. She's an associate professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. But Frazier's success is not in these accolades. It is in the amplitude and intensity of her investigations. She said, people called Braddock a ghost town, but I grew up there, people live there, we're not ghosts. Her work is a repost. It restores black life and the lives of black women into the narrative of this town. They are not ghosts. Frazier's self-revealing photographs answer a nagging question from the history of the medium. What might photos like the ones Dorothea Lange made in the 1930s about migrant fa families have looked like if they had been taken by those people themselves? Frazier traces out a web of related concerns, the difficulty of family life in such a place, the imperishability of love, the injustice of hospital closure, the exclusion of black history, the bonds among generations of women. The same intelligence animates the work she has engaged in subsequently, most notably her investigations in Flint, Michigan. She begins, as always, with a human scale, the human body, but always with an eye towards what has altered the wider environment. Her enterprise thrills me. I look up to her as an exemplar of intellectual dignity, moral seriousness, and artistic brilliance. Really sorry that Latoya is not here today, uh, but we're going to watch a video of her work in Flint. You think about Gordon Parks and a Harlem family, which was published in Life magazine. Or you think about his collaboration with Ralph Ellison on Invisible Man. A collaboration between black artists, black photographers, black poets and writers trying to tell another story and narrative from the inside to the American public so they can see it clear for what it is. It is the everyday person, the everyday man, woman, and child that are experiencing the brutality and the pitfalls of capitalism, of inequality, of living in these small towns that have been abandoned by the state. They're the ones, these individuals and families are the ones that can express it and articulate it the best. When you think about water, you don't consider government. In fact, you don't consider people at all. Even though we've built plants and machines to alkanize and purify, when you think about it, you only in your most remote mind, if at all, think about God, something nature intended. When you think about water, you don't consider poison because poison isn't something you consider for yourself. You don't think about murder. The water crisis became public knowledge in April of 2014. And because Obama came on May 4th in 2016, and they had that image of him sipping that water, which was supposedly Flint River water, the American consciousness and psyche believed that the water crisis was over. 
it was in 2016 that I received a phone call from Elle magazine. The magazine that's about women, health, and beauty to build out a section for the September issue to actually have inside of it before you got to the fashion spreads 10 pages uninterrupted a photo essay talking about the water crisis. It was important for me to kind of just pivot slightly out of the generational connection between my grandmother, mother, and me to this other generation of three women, which was Renee Cobb, her daughter, Shay Cobb, and Shay's daughter, Zion. What it's like now for them to have to figure out their relationship to water and how to live with contaminated and poisoned water. Shay, she's a school bus driver, and she was also very active in organizing and public protest as well. She's a singer, she is a poet. She had so much charisma and hope and faith and just such a positive outlook regardless of this circumstance uh, that is completely created a man-made disaster because of inequality and racism. Why not collaborate with her and get her voice and her words and her perspective? She made it very clear to Hearst Corporation and Elle magazine. She said, you know, don't come here expecting to see a victim. That's not who we are. She understands how the media shapes stereotypes and discourse around black women, black families, and black communities. And so I really relied on Shay being my eyes. I was simply being an empathic witness, being led by her through this town. It is a duty, a privilege, and an honor to be able to use these cameras to serve others and to bring a real human story forward in a complex situation. What's the work of culture for car calling our attention to moments of crisis? Latoya Ruby Frazier's interventions give us a sense of what it takes. It also takes courage when our laws fail. It takes the courage that's exemplified in the work of our next two speakers, Chelsea Clinton, who's vice chair at the Clinton Foundation, working extremely hard to drive programmatic objectives that have as their greater goal to create opportunities for people to build a better future for themselves and their families and their communities. The Vision and Justice Project so, was animated by a charge that Chelsea Clinton gave me to ensure that the work did not simply go out to those who understand and believe in the power of culture for greater racial equity, but for those who don't. And so I very much thank her for that charge and for the work that she does. Her conversations with our next speaker inspired this intervention in our convening, and Dr. that is Dr. Mona Hanna Echeta. She's a pediatrician, professor, and public health advocate who spearheaded efforts to reveal and to publicize and to fix the water crisis in Flint. This occurred, of course, in 2014, and because we're short on time, I'm just going to fast forward to what you know took place, which is that she understood that the only way to stop the lead poisoning would be to prevent undeniable proof on a national platform that this was taking place. It took courage. She revealed her team's findings. She revealed the findings before they were actually peer-reviewed, which we know in academia is a risk but she did so to prioritize the health of the community over the risk to her own career. This resulted in brutal backlash, but the resistance paid off, and the city switched the water back to its original source, and President Obama declared a federal emergency. She has since been called to testify twice before the US Congress, and has received the Freedom of Expression Courage Award by Pan America, and was named by Time Magazine one of the 100 most influential people in the world, which uh, seems an appropriate accolade, but almost a, one incommensurate to the extraordinary work that you have done. So I now invite you to welcome them to the stage. Chelsea Clinton. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, well
Well, thank you, Sarah, for that generous introduction. Uh, I think I have to uh, just own that I have known and loved Sarah for almost two decades. So it is such an honor and a privilege uh, to be here and to be part of something that she has created. Um, it is also always an honor and a privilege to be here with Dr. Mona, one of my all-time heroes. And I think uh, in Sarah's introduction, it's probably evident why I feel that way so strongly. And after our conversation today, I hope that there will uh, be even more fans in the Dr. Mona Club. Um, <clears throat> you, know, uh, you know, Winton said earlier that uh, part of his mission is to help make the invisible visible, and he does that in art. We just saw so beautifully uh, how uh, Latoya Ruby Fraser does that through photography, including in Flint. And Dr. Mona, you do that through data and storytelling. And one of the real pernicious challenges of lead is that it is invisible to the naked eye, it is odorless, it is tasteless. And so you had to marshal uh, data and stories to be able to help raise this urgent cry. You know, we sit here just right after the ignominious five-year anniversary of when Flint switched water sources from the Great Lakes to the Flint River. And yet it would take another year and a half um, before you were finally listened to. Could you talk a little bit about um, why and how you decided to use data to help kind of puncture through the denialism and the obstruction? Yeah, so um, like Chelsea meant mentioned, y yesterday was our five-year anniversary of our water switch. So April 2014 is when that fateful decision was made where a, a, a button was pushed and we started drawing our water from the Flint River um, after really getting our water for half a century from the Great Lakes. Michigan is literally surrounded by the largest source of fresh water in the world. Um, and for about a year and a half, the people of Flint were heroic and they were brave and they were loud and they knew something was wrong. It was brownish and greenish. Do you guys remember those pictures? It was brownish and greenish and it smelled weird and tasted weird and there was bacteria issues. And the list goes on of what was happening with this water. And the crisis really never should have started. It was man-made choices that created this direct crisis. Just like LaToya said, it was driven by um, lost democracy, driven by stolen opportunity, driven by austerity and racism, by neglect, by a population that we choose not to see. Um, and it, it never should have started. It sh should have ended when that first mom raised a jug of brown water. It should have ended when we actually had the science that there was lead in the water. My work never should have happened. You never needed to have a pediatrician come in and use science to prove that our children were being poisoned. That, that's, that never, ever, ever should have happened. But I knew after kind of a year and a half of denials and, and the dismissive nature of what was happening, that if I was going to make any impact in the story, if I was going to truly fight for my children, which as a pediatrician I have taken an oath to do, um, that I would need the data in my pocket. Um, and not just data, um, it was also very much driven by storytelling. So this press conference that we had, which was a total academic no-no of releasing research before it was peer-reviewed, um, it was totally disobedient, but it had to be done because that peer review process, like any academic knows, takes a long time. Um, so we released that research, and, and my presentation was not just graphs and PowerPoints and science and facts, but it was also stories, and it was a story about a child, and I held up a water bottle. So I leaned on kind of my history as a former drama student on, on how, to, how to best share, um, share those stories and, and really wake the nation up to this literally most emblematic environmental and public health disaster of the century. And yet, not everyone wanted to hear what you had to say, and in fact, there were active efforts to discredit you and disparage you, to minimize even your kind of robust uh, data that showed that lead levels had exploded in kids uh, across the county um, from before the water switch to afterward. Um, and since, you know, Sarah mentioned your courage and your persistence, can you just talk about how you continue to help build that case and continue to muster the evidence and the stories that you knew were necessary because every day that this was happening was another day where kids' brains were literally being damaged. Absolutely, and, and the story is, is not 
about a person. It, uh, the reason that I'm so excited to share the story is because it's about a team. It's about an unexpected team that came together. So, you know, yes, you all know that the story of Flynn is a story of a crime, like an absolute crime committed against some of the most vulnerable people in this country, people that we choose not to see. But it is also this incredible story of people just like you and I that came together, moms and activists and journalists and scientists and students and doctors and, and stood up and said, we're not happy with the status quo. We're not accepting what you're telling us, and stood up and came together um, and demanded action for our children. Um, so that is how kind of the story exploded and came to light um, and how we were able to persist. So it was through teamwork, it was through science, it was through persistence that, that evidently spoke truth to power and got, you know, exposed this man-made crisis. And you know, something that you mentioned earlier, Dr. Winner, that you and I have talked a lot about um, that is embedded in the title of your book, you know, what the eyes don't see. You know, it's not only what the eyes don't see in terms of the lead in the water, it's also what too often, you know, are, are the people who are not seen and not listened to and who have been purposefully and consistently disenfranchised. Um, and I think one of the things that I know we find so troubling is that when the water crisis struck Flint, um, about 50% of the black population in Michigan was living under emergency management, meaning they were not living under uh, elected officials of their own choosing. They were living under kind of effectively rule by the state and only 2% of white Michigan was living under emergency management. Can you talk about kind of how you just have seen as a pediatrician and as a public health advocate and activist kind of that loss of democracy yeah. Uh, and enfranchisement in action, because we spend a lot of time, I think, now publicly, understandably focused on voter disenfranchisement before people get to vote. But I think it's also important to realize that sometimes we disenfranchise people after they've actually voted, including yeah. uh, in Michigan to a really large extent. Yeah, so, you know, the story of Flint has so many kind of national relevant uh, relationships. So it's, it's, it's not just this isolated story about this one crazy city that changed its water source and poisons people, um, but it is a story of really kind of the deeper crises that are facing our nation right now. Um, and we'll get to that democracy piece, but it's also a story of what happens when we disrespect science. And that you turn on the news today and, and we are actively denying the science of climate change and vaccines. It's a story of environmental injustices that continue where people who are poor and minority continue um, to be burdened, proportionally by environmental contamination. Um, it's a story really on the assault of the promise of our children. Um, it's a story of what happens when we break, you know, don't invest in our infrastructure. But, but so much of the story of Flint is also a story of what happens when democracy is broken down and taken away from our most vulnerable populations. The city of Flint was under financial emergency management. An emergency manager came in, they just reported to the governor the role of our elected officials, our mayor and city council was literally taken away, usurped overnight. Um, and that emergency manager had one job and that job was austerity. It was to save money, really, at no matter what the cost. Um, and, you know, not driven by accountability, not driven by justice, not driven by public health. Um, it was all about what, you know, what will balance the books. And this was our former governor whose mantra was that we should run government like a business. And that doesn't work for, for things like water and children. Well, and I think one of the most painful kind of illustrative anecdotes is that it would have cost about $100 a day to add the anti-corrosive treatment uh, to the water coming from the Flint River, and that would have prevented the lead from leaching out of the pipes. So it was not worth $100 a day to the emergency manager and his team to be able to protect the children and the families of Flint. You know, the, the story is so much portrayed as a story of austerity and cost, cunt, cost cutting, and then we realized that you know, it would have cost hardly nothing to treat this water properly. So that treatment chemical wasn't added, the pump to install that treatment chemical wasn't added, um, and now in the kind of uh, released emails, we hear you know, this back and forth, somebody at the EPA said that Flint wasn't a city worth going out on a limb for. Um, when the state was finally asked by the EPA to treat the water properly, the, the state drinking water official said, but who's drinking this water anyways? Um, so the, the neglect and the indifference and the blindness 
to this population was clearly evident, and that is why repeatedly investigations, um, the race and demographics of the population have been highlighted. This never would have happened in a richer or a wider city. This was a population that we chose not to see and, and not to care for. It never would have happened in Ann Arbor. No. Um, you know, one of the other, I think, really illuminating parts of your storytelling work is linking what has happened in Flint in recent history to kind of the industrial history of Flint, and particularly to General Motors, which I know is a kind of contextually complex story for you to share because your dad worked at General Motors, and you say that's really what enabled him to give your family the American dream. Everybody in Michigan has an auto industry connection, like one or two degrees away. <laughs> um, and yet you still kind of, with such a clear-eyed uh, perspective, kind of detail um, how this story is inextricably linked to General Motors, and it's not just kind of the disinvestment over the last few decades. Um, it's actually kind of the original decisions by General Motors in the 1920s to add kind of lead derivatives to engines to help prevent the knocking sound from being too loud because clearly kind of the comfort of our ears is more important than the safety of our children's brains or to kind of add lead to gasoline. Even though already in the 1920s, General Motors knew that these were poisonous. They may not have been yet able to classify them as neurotoxins, but they knew they were poisonous. Could you talk a little bit about that and kind of why it was so important to you to include that history in your book and, and your continued advocacy? Yeah, so we've already heard how important history is today. And it is, it's so important in, in this story. Um, and the history of Flint is this history of extremes, really kind of where greed met, met solidarity, where bigotry met fairness, and really where the struggle for equality has played out in, in the United States. The birthplace of General Motors brought the birthplace of labor contracts, which really made Flint this promised land and that great migration north for African Americans all over the world, or for immigrants all over the world. Um, people moved to Flint for, for prosperity, for opportunity, and most many people argue that that American dream, um, the middle class, was born in Flint. Um, but then General Motors, um, you know, driven by capitalism and greed, um, had a patent on tetraethyl lead, the use of lead in our gasoline. Um, and we hear so much about lead now, and we think that we, we you know, it wasn't a big deal back then. Um, and I'm going to tie in some other things that we talked about today but it was actually this amazing woman physician. Her name was Alice Hamilton. Who knows about Alice Hamilton? She's got Harvard roots. She was the very first woman professor at Harvard. Um, but at that time, she couldn't get tickets to the football game. She couldn't go in the faculty club and she couldn't march in commencement, um, but she persisted. So she was the nation's expert on occupational diseases in the 1920s. And she, and she was also, um, she got these social justice roots um, by living at the Hull House. So she lived at the Hull House in the early 1900s uh, with Jane Addams, and that's when uh, she treated immigrant children, and she had these well-child clinics, and she was seeing what, what, what industry was doing to, to people's health, and she really got into the, the world of occupational health. Um, so this was this amazing woman in the 1920s who recognized the evils of putting lead in gasoline and was sharing you know, to anybody who would listen that this is going to be a public health scourge, that we are going to poison generations of children. Um, and what, what eventually prevailed was industry's upper hand and something called the keyhole paradigm, which really set a precedent in public health that harm must be proven before something is done. So it was all about show me the proof. And this is absolutely backwards. But this is really where we are today, especially with our, a lot of our environmental health regulations. Um, so, th so the history is important because you know this is something I teach my students. This is, this is something my parents always taught me. Um, if we want to solve our complex problems moving forward, we have to start by looking back. And we do such a good job at closing our eyes to anything that's too dark or too complicated. Um, but we have to look at the past and look at history before we can ever move forward because we literally walk over darkness and complex history every single day. And you know, Dr. Mona, it wasn't only uh, General Motors who shut down Dr. Hamilton, right? It was also the federal government. Yes. Yep. The Surgeon General uh, sided with, at that time, sided with the auto industry and their, um, their rented white coats and their apologist scientists who were spreading fake science. 
And it took decades. It took decades to get lead out of gasoline. We were, as a nation, stubbornly slow to protect children. Um, if you just look at lead in water, we we've, um, didn't restrict the use of lead in our service lines till 1986, but not until 2014, just a few years ago, did we restrict the use of lead in our brass fixtures and faucets. Um, and to date, all of these regulations have not caught up with science and do not put public health and children's health um, at the foremost. And lead isn't only a persistent challenge in Flint. I mean, lead is a challenge in the water in parts of Cleveland, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and actually in thousands of communities across our country. Yeah, and it's not just the water. So, you know, when I heard about the possibility of lead in the water, any pediatrician would freak out because we know it's this irreversible neurotoxin. It impacts cognition and behavior and development. It's even been linked to things like criminality. Um, but the reason that I got so alarmed is because that we know it as a form of environmental racism. The burden of lead does not fall equally on our nation's children. Uh, it is kids in, in Flint and Detroit and Chicago and Philly and Baltimore. Kids are already burdened with so many of life's toxicities who are also burdened um, with, with elevated exposure exposure to lead. And yet, yeah, Dr. Mona, you're not just accepting the status quo. And I know you are um, kind of persistently, stubbornly optimistic, um, partly because of the kind of community of pediatricians and activists, journalists, advocates, parents you know, that you spoke about earlier who really raised the alarm about the crisis, but also who are doing everything they can not only to mitigate the impacts of lead, but to ensure that kind of children in Flint have every opportunity that any, any parent would ever hope for any of our kids. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what you've done over the last few years and what you're doing now? Yeah, so I have this amazing privilege of waking up every day, working hand in hand with the people of Flint and so many other organizations to make sure that our children have the brightest future possible. Uh, so from the moment of recognition of this crisis, which was not just a lead crisis, we had um, Legionnaire's disease, people died from a pneumonia, so there's homicide charges against folks, it's skin issues, but by and large, this was a, this was a trauma of trust. Uh, there was, people were betrayed by every governmental agency that was supposed to protect them. Uh, there's anger and fear and guilt and stress and um, anxiety and all these we know also lead to poor outcomes on top of really decades of crisis and neglect and and you know a history of kind of austerity and racism and discrimination that that already threatened the future of our children um, so we have taken this holistic approach and have thrown everything at our kids everything that science tells us will, will support children so Flint is this egregious story of kind of science denial science spoke truth to power and we are leaning on the incredible science of child development and brain plasticity and resilience to, to mitigate the impact of this crisis. So what we've been able to put in place is really a model, uh, things like brand new child care centers and home visiting programs and breastfeeding support and um, early literacy books and a lot of Chelsea's awesome books um, and school health services and Medicaid expansion, all these things that we know kids need. Um, but as a pediatrician, I'm not naive to think that that's enough to make a healthy family and a healthy community. We are working also upstream on the bigger issues like poverty mi mitigation and economic development and restorative justice and environmental justice and participatory democracy and self-determination, trying to make the city whole again in, in hand in hand in, in partnership. And the beauty of our work, and like I shared earlier, is that it's not an isolated story. There's kids all over that wake up to the same nightmares as my Flint kids. Um, with great irony, you know, Flint is birthplace of the American dream. As an, as an immigrant, I was a recipient of the American dream, but my kids in Flint literally wake up to nightmares as if that dream was never supposed to be for them, um, where zip codes play larger roles and trajectories than genetic codes. Um, so what we hope to do is very much shine a light on, on the circumstance of all children. Children, where kids all over this nation wake up to things like poverty and lost democracy and stolen opportunity um, and, and, and work on addressing all those issues. And, you know, in our last few minutes, I do want to go back to talk a little bit more about democracy because one of the things, you know, that we've seen just even in the last um, few months since you've had a new governor in Michigan uh, is that the new governor has very much kind of taken it as her charge to try to have both real accountability and more kind of representative structures going forward, including in um, who is monitoring the environment, who is raising alarm bells, who is empowered and who is protected to be able to do that. And yet she has been stymied 
uh, at times, even stopped at times by the legislature. Could you just talk a little bit about kind of the current dynamics and kind of how in some ways Flint is being more well represented at the local and the state levels and in other ways there still is this ongoing kind of neglect and uh, disparagement? Yeah, so we have no more cities in Michigan under emergency management, uh, which was grossly undemocratic and unjust. The law is still on the book, though, uh, but no other cities have lost, clearly lost democracy. Um, the mayor has regained her powers, um, and the new governor has come in and really has been learning the lessons of Flint and, and trying to make an impact. Her very first executive order was a whistleblower protection order, so that state employees who have any concerns should voice those concerns. She's also appointed two new positions um, in the state. One is an environmental justice advocate as well as a drinking water advocate, very much learning the lessons of Flint. And she's restructured our environmental department, which really kind of the, 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 the blame of this crisis really lies at their feet. Um, so she's trying to do what she can um, to address the situation to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, however, our legislature is one of the most gerrymandered legislatures in the state. Just yesterday, our federal court demanded redistricting. Um, so her effort um, it is difficult for her to accomplish things um, that, that she needs to be done if, if the legislature needs to be involved. So there's, there's still many folks who um, don't want to learn the lessons of Flint, don't want to strengthen public health, health, recreation, health regulations, don't want to expand democracy, don't want to in include multiple diverse voices at the table. So what else do you think needs to happen from your perspective, you know, as a pediatrician, you know, as a mom? Um, kind of in, in Flint. So as a, as a professional, as a parent, as an advocate, you know, what do you think still needs to be done? Um, so I, I'm going to take this kind of um, beyond Flint. So, you know, like I, the title of my book is What the Eyes Don't See, and we've talked a lot about the, the invisibles. Um, so, it, you know, it's very much about people and places and problems we, we choose not to see, and people chose to choose to close their eyes to Flint. That was that city over there. That will never happen anywhere else. Just, like, literally close your eyes and look the other way and cover things up. Um, but that's not isolated to Flint. The, the, you know, there are injustices happening all over outside our, our, our front doors. And, and my message is that, we, you know, you don't have to come to Flint to make a difference. Just open your eyes. And it is not enough to be awake. Um, we have to act. We have to act no matter how scary it is, no matter how hard it is, no matter how impossible it may seem, no matter how many people might try to silence you, um, we have to act. And, and when we do it together, we are stronger. Um, the story of Flint is a, is a testament to the idea that people coming together, an unexpected ragtag, diverse group of people coming together can make a difference. So it is ultimately a story about, about all of us. It's, you know, it's not just a Flint story. It's about all of us. It's about who we are and who we want to be and, and what kind of place that we want to leave our children. And we all have a role to play no matter who we are and, and what we do. Um, I mentioned earlier that I do this work as a pediatrician because I literally took an oath to protect kids. I literally took an oath. Um, but very much implicit in this story, and I know, Chelsea, you get this so much, it's, it's, it's we all took an oath, no matter who we are. We all took an oath to open our eyes to injustices, to, to fight for our vulnerable kids, and to make sure that their trajectories are not bound by zip code, or state of birth, or color of skin, or country of origin, or drinking water source. Um, that really we can work towards a place where democracy and equality and opportunity are once again encouraged and advanced for all of our children. There should be no such thing. There should be no such thing as other people's kids. They're all my um, kids. My, my, my own biological children know that they have 6,000 siblings. Like, <laughs> mom's not home today because she's with our other siblings. <laughs> um, well, thank your kids for uh, sharing you not only with uh, their 5,998 siblings in Flint, uh, but really with all of us. And just um, in our final minute, you know, Dr. Mona, though, if people here do want to help support your work in Flint, um, what should they do? Because I do want to give you a chance to say that explicitly because there are a lot of incredibly powerful and influential and creative and dynamic and innovative people in this room 
So if they want to help Flint, what should they do? Sure, and we're grateful to so many folks who have been supported, including the Ford Foundation, who was there early on and, and helped really with the infrastructure and the capacity building. Um, so right after the crisis, we created the Flint Kids Fund, flintkids.org. It's our tomorrow fund. It's what's been funding our um, literacy programs and our breastfeeding support, and really to be able to do this work 20 years uh, down the road. So flintkids.org. So flintkids.org. So if you take only kind of three things, I guess, from today, please take... Um, the fact that Dr. Mona is incredibly heroic, but also recognizes that she's not alone and that we all need to do everything we can to support um, all of the Dr. Monas who help raise alarm bells and help protect our public health and hopefully prevent these crises from happening uh, in the first place. Two, that democracy always matters and those of us who aren't in a place shouldn't determine what that means. Uh, and three, flintkids.org. Um, so really, just thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Harvard. Uh, thank you, Visit and Justice. And thank you, Chelsea. Well, thank you, thank Dr. You. Mona. Thank, thank you all. You. Black girls need less nurturing, less protection, less support, less comfort. The research shows that these beliefs are widely held by adults in the United States. A recent report from the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality finds that adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers. And black girls aren't alone. We also know from the research that adults view black boys as older, more troublesome, and more likely to be guilty than white boys, starting from as young as age 10. When reports first surfaced of the death of 12-year-old Tamir Rice, who was shot by police while playing in the park with a toy gun, he was repeatedly described in the media not as a child, but as a young man. This phenomenon of viewing black children as miniature adults means they're disciplined more often, suspended more frequently, and punished more harshly, including being more likely to be referred to police and arrested. Adults projecting suspicion and risk onto very young black bodies is a particularly pernicious manifestation of racial inequality in America. Normal childhood behaviors, tantrums and disobedience become a criminal threat when black kids do them. And this age compression increasingly denies black children their childhood and robs them of the freedom of just being kids. So this next discussion on race, childhood and inequality could not be more timely and I'm tremendously honored to be here to introduce three really extraordinary guests. We have an opportunity this morning to hear from a multi-generational group of leaders who are considering the crucial function of the arts and culture in shifting race-based narratives that impact the life outcomes of children. We'll also have a chance to hear how their work highlights the role that students and educators are playing in constructing new stories and imagining new modes of visualizing black children. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists now. Robin Bernstein is the Dillon Professor of American History and Professor of African and African American Studies and Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Harvard. She's a preeminent cultural historian, prolific scholar, and distinguished educator whose work focuses on theater, performance, and childhood, with the goal of producing new knowledge about US cultural history, particularly American formations of race from the 19th century to the present. Her most recent book, Racial Innocence, Performing American Childhood from Slavery to Civil Rights, won five awards for its groundbreaking study of the racialized and gendered ideologies that shape, inform, and continue to haunt notions of American childhood. And I should say that Robin's not only a brilliant scholar, she also holds um, a Harvard College professorship in recognition of her distinguished contributions to undergraduate teaching and mentorship. 
Our second panelist is Naomi Wadler. She's a sixth grade student activist attending George Mason Elementary School in Alexandria, Virginia. On March 14, 2018, one month after the Parkland shooting, she organized a walkout at her school, and she added an extra minute to honor Cortland Arrington, a 17-year-old black girl who was shot to death at her Alabama high school just three weeks after Parkland, but whose death received very little national media attention. Because of her efforts, Naomi was an invited speaker at the March for Our Lives in Washington, D.C. just a few days later. And her speech highlighted the disproportionate impact of gun violence on girls of color and the lack of media coverage and public outrage about the stories of gun violence involving people who look like her. Naomi has made it her mission to share the stories of black and brown girls that we don't see on the front page and is using her platform to give a voice to those who don't have one. She's received many honors and awards, including the Disruptive Innovation Award at the Tribeca Film Festival, and was recognized by Teen Vogue 21 Under 21. And she said that one day she plans to run the New York Times, <laughs> but for now she's teaching herself the ukulele. <laughs> and you'll notice that we actually have three chairs up here because we have a surprise addition to today's panel. Yara Shahidi is a humanitarian, feminist, social activist, actor, and producer. She recently founded 18 by 18, a voter registration platform that encourages newly eligible voters to register, vote, and give voice to the policy issues that are most important to them. Last September, 18 by 18 hosted the We Vote Next Summit in Los Angeles, bringing together 120 delegates from every state in the District of Columbia, along with other accomplished student leaders, activists, and artists from around the country to amplify the voices, stories, and concerns of first-time voters. Yara is also an outspoken advocate for the importance of education for girls, including founding Yara's Club in partnership with the Young, Young Women's Leadership Network of New York to bring high school students together to discuss social issues and empower youth to defeat poverty through education. So Yara began her acting career at the age of six and is perhaps best known for her role as Zoe on ABC's Blackish and its spin-off Grownish. She also recently made her directorial debut with X, a short film that follows a black child on his walk to school in the morning, showing him physically shifting and evolving to match the expectations and the stereotypes that are projected onto him by the world around him. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dean Gay, for the extraordinary introduction. Thank you, Sarah Lewis, for convening us here today. Thank you to everyone who has made this possible, this extraordinary extended conversation that I am so honored to be a part of. And thank you to my beautiful, wonderful co-panelists, who I'm so excited to be speaking with today. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Me too. <laughs> So I was thinking that we could start by talking a little bit about how you became activists, how you decided that that was something that you wanted to do with your life, how you became people who are thinking very deeply about justice and visuality. How did that happen for each of you? Naomi, we could start with you. So I've always had parents who had very open, honest conversations with me about race. And I knew that when all these tragedies happened, such as um, the riot in Charlottesville, I really wanted to do something about it, but I didn't really know how. And so when the Parkland shooting happened and I saw all of these teenagers and kids really speaking out and speaking up um, about what they believed in, I kind of just followed and along in line, and when I spoke at the March for Our Lives, um, everybody was talking about Parkland and gun violence, but that wasn't really my story, because while I've had some experiences, um, I'm not an inner city kid, and I don't really, it's not, that's not my story, and I wanted to talk about something that I knew about, and something that I have lived, and so I wanted to talk about how gun violence affects black women. 
And for me, I, I similarly come from a family that has always had that conversation in our household. Um, being half black and half Iranian, what I appreciate is that I had a very global perspective from a very young age, and the expectation that we would um, understand and appreciate our cultural heritage as well as extend the same empathies and sympathies that we have for our own communities to other communities. Um, and it, it is very helpful as well to have grandparents on either side who have always been socially engaged um, from my, my papa, who has um, always been in academics, but has been the head of school boards, has um, been the person making space for black students. And so he's the person where I actually take notes when we have conversations. <laughs> um, and, and so that conversation happened um, from the moment I was born and similarly when I started making money from this industry that we're in, my, my family kind of sat me down and they were saying, okay, so you're gonna have three kind of pots. You're gonna determine what you spend, what you save, and what you donate. But within that meant that even our basic infrastructures of how I view and intake money had everything to do with how I decide to give back and be involved with the greater world around me. And so I think a matter of being able to be on a show like Blackish, which inherently had a political kind of leaning to it and talked about what it meant to be a black family, it meant that at the age of 14, I was given opportunities to talk about the state of America on national platforms in which I don't know if that opportunity would have been extended to me otherwise if it wasn't for the nature of that show. And so it was a matter of really just understanding how passionate I was about the world around me and then using that platform to then extend it to topics that weren't necessarily being discussed or directly related to the show. How did you get interested specifically in voter registration? Um, so I'm a nerd and I have, <laughs> but uh, happily won. Um, and the one thing about voting that I realized is that it, it's set up like an upper middle class hobby. And so it's <laughs> in that you have to have the time to physically go vote. If you have an hourly job, that is not always your reality. And then there's always, I mean, we've heard about voter disenfranchisement, but then even earlier than that, when you look at voter education, there is a political jargon that's used that's intentionally creates a community of people who actually understand our political system. And for those who are outside of that, then voting in the government is something that happens to you rather than something that happens with you. And so understanding that midterms were coming up and that's again an election that has not been emphasized, especially amongst my generation, we usually uh, focus on presidential elections and realizing how integral um, midterms were in setting us up for success in the presidential election and setting us up for success is really important to me to have a campaign that really focused on young voters such as myself um, to understand what we're voting on because even as somebody who I've had the time, space, and privilege of being extremely informed and the environments to be surrounded by mentors who constantly pour into me, I was still confused by the process. And so it's really a matter of being able to share the privileges that I had of these great speakers who broke down what it means to be a voter, what it means to be active. Um, and it was really just a, a special opportunity to be in relationship with people to prove that civic engagement is something that happens on a daily basis. I'd actually love to take this opportunity to share an extraordinary insight that was shared with me a couple of years ago. Um, I got into a conversation with a woman from the League of Women Voters who had been sitting outside my public library for months registering people of all ages to vote. And she told me that from her months of conversations with new voters, she had gained this extraordinary insight, which is that for a lot of voters, voting feels like taking a test. And because it feels like taking a test, it, first of all, it feels scary and unpleasant. Did my mic just go out? No, there, there we go. It feels scary and unpleasant, but also it um, short circuits certain kinds of common sense, such as the fact that you are allowed to bring somebody with you into the voting booth, that you are allowed to write down who you intend to vote for, because those things would not be permitted with a test. And when she said that, I thought, this has such implications for the educational system. 
when we have an educational system that is increasingly emphasizing high, um, high stakes tests, tests which are extremely racialized and that have very different, ex uh, that uh, are experienced very differently by people of different races and classes. So I just wanted to take this moment to share that insight that was given to me by this woman from the League of Women Voters. So now I want to come back to the two of you. Um, we had a pre-conversation to um, a, a couple of days ago, the three of us spoke on the phone to come up with some of what we might like to talk about during this session. And one of the themes that came out really strongly was the theme of adultification. Naomi, you were the one who brought up this idea of adultification, and uh, Dean Gay spoke about it a little bit as well. So I'm wondering if you could tell people what that term means, because some people might not have encountered the term adultification before, and if you could speak a little bit about how adultification has affected your activism and how it's affected you. So adultification of black girls is, well, first of all, studies show that black girls are seen as adults at the age of five. Um, and, <laughs> um, and so they're just, they're disciplined more harshly and they're seen as less innocent and people, they're expected to act as adults, but even though they're children. And, um, I don't think that it's really affected um, my platform, mm -hmm. um, but I am aware that it is a very real thing and I like to talk about it and raise awareness about it because it's just not okay. Mm -hmm. Because you can be um, a five-year-old girl and be so confused as to why when your white classmate starts crying, they get comforted, but then when you start crying, you are told to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you felt um, the effects of adultification at all in the way that the media has treated you? I'm actually not sure. Um, I don't really pay attention, a lot of attention to that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's probably a good choice. Mm -hmm. How about you? Have you felt that this has been a factor in your activism? Most definitely. Um, I think partially because uh, a factor of adultifying somebody, the, the, the problem that I find with it, there are many problems, but the problem that I find with it is that there's a temporariness to being an adult, and so you are placed in the category of adulthood when it's convenient, and then quickly taken out of it when you are then put in position to defend yourself, and so it is no longer a conversation happening amongst peers, but it's a conversation in which somebody is given the power to reinstate the hierarchy when necessary, and you see this when you look at the, the as we've discussed before, but the killing of black boys and black girls, and when it turns to our ability to then stand up for ourselves, we're not given the same right. And then on a much smaller scale of being from the, the liberal bubble of California, of LA, it's been interesting um, as of late to even see how I'm perceived, and I think we had talked about this previously, in that a lot of the articles that have come out as of late have made the point of asking whether how I speak is premeditated, mm -hmm. um, pre-planned, politician-like. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting because these are things that range from Time Magazine to Cosmo. And I didn't realize how, um, how concerned they were with whether or not I was being authentic because I didn't match whatever their, their preconceived notion was of childhood. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're not viewing me as an adult either. And so I think the paradox of where I stand in their eyes was something that has been uh, something that I've paid extra attention to and I'm grateful to be able to have parents on this journey who have been there every step of the way with me because they have intentionally maintained my childhood, especially in an industry which has systematically said by the age of 16, you should be able to represent yourself on set. You should be able to, and you've not been given the equipment to do that. And as much as this is something that happens within the industry of entertainment, it's something that happens on a regular basis. Something that happens in schools, when you look at the criminalization of our hair and how those conversations go, when you look at strip searches performed on students, mm -hmm. how does that happen? Mm -hmm. It is because you've adultified them and then when it comes time to actually be in conversation, you've no longer given them the freedom or the rights to stand up for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yara reminded me of something. Um, she talked, you talked about um, being put in a place of adulthood when it's convenient for people. Um, and I can relate to that because people, when I'm on stage, often people will treat me as adult, as an adult, and they will um, 
just, they won't treat me as a child, but then the second that we walk off stage, they won't include me in the conversations about the next steps, and they... <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so what, they don't include you in conversations about next steps. What is a time when you had ideas about next steps that then got cut off? This is a good moment to share some ideas about next, next steps, specifically about gun violence or about something else? Um, I was at an event and I was off stage. I had just given a speech and they were talking about, um, I, don't, I don't even know because they just, they were in like a circle and they weren't like letting me in. Mm. And it was, but when I was on stage, they were praising me and they were telling me how smart I was mm -hmm. and they were treating me like I was older than I am. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as we walked off stage, it's like I wasn't even there. Wow, wow. Did you want to follow up on that at all? Or? I remember having an interesting experience in which we were at um, a shoot, a photo shoot, and they were talking about inclusion in television, gender inclusion in television, and it's fascinating the positioning of gender to erase all of other categories of identity. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were at this shoot talking about women in television, and I had made a point of reaching out beforehand to ask who they're including. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in a particular place in which we're really fortunate to have many people on television that reflect many other people. And they were like, oh no, it'll be great, it'll be diverse. Mm -hmm. I get there, and somehow they've, and mind you, these are all incredible actresses, somehow they found three actresses that look like triplets. <laughs> and so I'm there, they, they, I think they put me in the back of the photo because my hair was big. Um, <laughs> small things. But um, then they wanted to have a round table in which we discussed inclusion. And I, being sick of being the representative of, because inherently I think it's unfair to people that I'm representing for me to be the face of, when I know I'm doing an inadequate job of representing all struggles and the intention of me saying why are there more people in the room of different backgrounds is because me explaining, as much as I, I deeply try and educate myself to be as inclu inclusive as possible, it'd be reductive if I was the face of every other identity you could think of, me being the face of Gen Z, of the global conversation and the black conversation and the female conversation all in one. And so I had asked politely to just not participate. Mm -hmm. And the, the editor of the magazine came up to me and was like, well, tell me why. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I told you why. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, then don't you think it'd be a great opportunity to explain like what your problem is on screen? Like, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what was, and, and not to go like play by play, but what was fascinating was in this moment, we are in a circle and this grown woman, you see my publicist, you see my mother, right? They've made themselves apparent. They've been involved in the conversation. She's addressing me, but she's not hearing me. And she keeps doing the same thing. She keeps addressing me, asking me why I do not want to participate and how unfair it is. And she says, well, I understand inclusion. I worked at the Washington Post. I said, great for you. But she's, again, not hearing the conversation. She's not giving me the privilege of then saying, hear my no. Mm -hmm. And a part of this conversation around inclusion is hearing my voice, including my voice in your process. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was just a minor example. And Given has very little um, kind of symptoms or any, any problem in the world, but it was fascinating in that moment to really see how that's highlighted within liberal structures. And we have an ongoing conversation about how neoliberalism is a perpetuator of these problems. Naomi, how do you think... Oh. <laughs> Naomi, how do you think the voices of black girls could be amplified better? people could recognize their struggles. And I think that a big part of the problem is that you have a lot of older white people saying that they understand mm -hmm. and they don't understand and they need to take the time to learn mm -hmm. and n acknowledge that they will never fully understand but that they can try and help. Mm -hmm. And that even without that, they, they can, even without the full knowledge, they can listen mm -hmm. and they can hear and they can, um, recognize that they could do better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. 
So I want to bring the conversation to the theme of the arts and vision and justice. Um, in an er earlier today, Theaster Gates said something extraordinary. He said many extraordinary things, but one of the things that um, stuck out for me the most, he said, have we created spaces where young people can be just? And I'd like to expand the, that, that idea from uh, physical spaces to arts more generally. So you are both people who are um, living lives in search of justice. You are both justice seekers. And my question is, what arts, what, it could be what physical spaces, what architectural spaces, but what arts more broadly have enabled you to be just, to seek justice? Um, well, I'd have to start by saying the art of education, if that counts, in that um, my parents really created a supplementary curricula for me mm -hmm. when I was growing up. I didn't watch TV or movies um, except for like an hour on the weekends. And so the TV was off Monday through Friday, and instead we were given audiobooks and books, and um, they told me I was, there was one moment in which I was doing a distance learning program, and I was so interested in history that I had finished all the courses a month early. And so they gave me the next set of courses in which they were talking about African history, which we were talking about Iranian history. My folklore books, not only did I have the real Grimm's fairy tale in second grade, which I, I think much to the dismay of my classmates when I told them how the fairy tales actually ended. <laughs> but uh, um, when I look at even Cinderella, something as iconic as that figure of what a princess is, the Cinderellas that I had were the Egyptian Cinderella, the Korean Cinderella, the Persian Cinderella. They found these stories, the global narrative, basically. And the other aspect of it was the fact that I had the privilege of having family in the arts. Um, I have an uncle who's a jazz musician, a cousin who's a rapper, and he's the one who not only through his art, but through extending to me, he's the one who introduced me to James Baldwin. And he's the person um, that put me in environments in which I could see and hear about other artists. And so even in school is where I learned about much of the art that I think has really impacted me. I went to an all girls Catholic school, but the first essay that we had to write on was on August Wilson, Wilson the piano lessons, and then the next was um, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And then we went through Sandra Cisneros, and it was interesting to be in an environment in which our stories were centered, in which this was not a class on African American or ethnic voices in, but this was our English class. And the idea of being central um, to, our, uh, to my own narrative, I think is what made arts really expansive for me and the fact that I was able to really select what I was viewing had made, given me the opportunity to understand the, the quote unquote American dream through a context that made more sense to me. And I think to quote James Baldwin as I always do, it would, the one thing he said in a conversation directly discussing the American dream is he says, by the age of five or six or seven, I'm loosely paraphrasing, um, but by the age of five or six or seven, every stick and stone you've seen is white, and so you assume you are too. Mm -hmm. And it comes as a great shock when you realize that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians while you were rooting for Gary Cooper, you are the Indians. It comes as a great shock when the, pl the flag that you pledged allegiance to, along with everybody else, did not pledge allegiance to you. And the reason I bring that up is because I think arts have been a form of reclaiming um, my allegiance to, to a community that considers me, mm -hmm. to a community that is constantly in consideration of others, rather than to an idea of nationalism. And media has everything to do with how we understand nationalism. Mm -hmm. And as of right now, we think nationalism is the Seinfeld show and Friends. And as much as I assume that those are fantastic shows, that is not a, something that includes me. Mm -hmm. Naomi? I went to the African American History Museum, um, and it was just such, there are six floors of black history, and it was just so cool. Um, I was pretty young, not that young, and <laughs> I'm still 12 though. Um, and it was just such a liberating experience because there were floors on scientists, and there were on black scientists, and there were floors on black entertainers, and there was just such a variety of black figures. Um, and it wasn't just overwhelmingly well-known black figures. It was black fi figures that people didn't really know about. Mm -hmm. And there were red box parts of the museum where it was graphic, but it still told those stories. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really amazing. Mm -hmm. 
What about in your school? What kinds of uh, what kinds of, of arts were you exposed to in your school or in your home, in your family, that have been able to, to seek justice? My history teacher, um, he's here with me today. Um, the um, first week of school, he showed us a picture of uh, this, or the painting of the signing of the Declaration, no, the Constitution, the signing of the Constitution. And he said, what do you see and what do you not see? And we said, well, we see a bunch of old white straight men, but we don't see a whole lot of diversity. Um, and that was just so helpful because I went to an old school where we learned a little bit about Martin Luther King, but we didn't learn about any black scientists and we didn't learn about slavery. Um, we learned about like Thomas Edison or something. Mm -hmm. and, so, <laughs> and so going to a new um, pretty diverse school where my history teacher is just so aware and where he can ask us what we see and what we don't see, um, that really inspired me. You look like you want to follow up on, on what Naomi said. Do you want to? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. Um, no, you put it really perfectly. <laughs> um, but I, I similarly had an ex same experience at the museum. And I remember coming out of the Emmett Till Memorial and being so moved. Um, but I think what I loved most was that it was a communal experience. And you know, I've always experienced, I've been really grateful to um, have a curricula in which it is a globalist perspective, but usually that's something that I individually received. And so to be in a space in which we were in community experiencing that was really special. And it speaks to just the power of, again, forms and infrastructures as the panel before I discussed, because I remember, and this was something we had even discussed, one of my pet peeves is the separation of Egypt from Africa, particularly in museum spaces. Um, in that, I remember going to the British Museum, and it was, it was quite hilarious, actually, because uh, you go in and they have the Rosetta Stone, which is pretty epic, and you move into the e Egypt exhibit in which they have all of these artifacts, and one of the artifacts said this is an Egyptian talking to an African. And then you have to go through um, the Americas, down the stairs, around the corner, open the door, and there's the Africa exhibit. And everything they had in there was post-colonial. And so what was fascinating was, one, there's no acknowledgement of that. So the only reason I was aware of that is because I was aware of when Africa was colonized and by whom. And so you're in these spaces and it, there was such a, a dearth of artifacts to pull from that they even had to um, reach out and um, pay for some artists to contribute artifacts. But it meant that there was no explanation as to why you're not seeing the beauty or celebration of Africa, because at this point, the rubber's in Belgium and there's been a genocide. At this point, the bronze from Benin is elsewhere. You can look in the Greece exhibit, or you can look in France or look in uh, the England exhibit, and that's where you're gonna see all of these African resources, but there's no acknowledgement of that. And so when you look at how our basic visual structures play into this idea of, um, inequality by exactly the point you were making by what they're not telling us and what we're not seeing, there in that moment you realize that we are okay separating, Af uh, separating Egypt and celebrating it, but there's been a systematic s separation from its blackness. And so these accomplishments have not been viewed as something that has been contributory or contributed by black people in any way. And they've been almost raceless. And so then when you look at Africa as a whole, there is no conversation around how integral it's been to the rest of the world dialogue. Mm -hmm. One theme that's coming out for me really strongly in this conversation is the importance of education and how education happens in so many different places. It happens in museums, it happens in families, it happens in schools, primary, secondary. Um, and one place that education, of course, happens is also in the media. And you are both people who have been educators through media. So um, I'm just very curious 
about what it is like for you to know that you have been role models for other black girls. You have been for many other children. You have been um, people who, have, who they have looked to um, and have been inspired by. So I'm curious about what that experience has been like for you, Naomi. It's been pretty amazing, but part of my own platform is not just taking all of the credit for myself. I really want to tell the stories of black girls, but I also want to hand them the mic and let them tell their own stories because I don't want, yes, I can represent them, but I don't know what it's like to be them. I mean, I am a black girl, but I don't know every one of their stories. Yeah honestly perfectly put and just building off of that I'm extremely grateful for the support that I've gotten just in um, what I do on television and outside of it and I'm aware of the role that characters play that blackish plays that grownish plays in telling a narrative that is inclusionary or inclusive of us but the one thing that it's really emphasized to me is again what we don't see and understanding the importance of infrastructure being on a show like blackish and being on a show like grownish I think um, what I've um, been most grateful for is the fact that we've been able to introduce new directors into network television, introduce new writers into network television, because it's breaking that cycle of not being given an opportunity because you don't have the resume, but not being given the opportunity to ever build the resume. And the one thing that the creator of both shows, Kenya Barris, has done is said that it's not a risk to believe in people. And so he has been able to push people into the system of being able to have a black female director on set is something that I'm grateful to have that experience. To be able to have different identities um, help form these shows has been so integral and goes to your point of passing over the mic because the goal of a show like Blackish or Grownish or even having started our own production company and what we're doing is this idea of allowing people to tell their own stories and allowing people the platform and um, the background and the resources and support to go tell their own stories. And so it is more so this idea of everything you're doing with the intention of opening the door for other people, because if it stops where you are, then that's where the progress stops as well. Thank you. So one thing we talked about in our pre-conversation was giving you two the opportunity to ask each other questions. So Yara, I was wondering if you could ask Naomi what you would like to ask her. My question's really simple, but I'd love to know what gives you hope? You have been in environments in which you've been an advocate talking about so many atrocities in the world, and so I was wondering what really inspires you or makes you happy. It really inspires me when I see people caring about what's going on in the world and educating themselves on what's going on in the world because if you, a big part of the problem is it's not that people don't care, it's that they don't know and it's just ignorance. And so when I see people who are taking the time to learn more about the terrible things that are happening but also still having, being optimistic for what they can do and for what others can do and for th what the world could do and recognizing that they can't just hand the mic over to somebody else. It's everybody's responsibility to make the world a better place. So the question I was gonna ask you was already asked. So I'm gonna, um, <laughs> I have to think of a new one now. We can come back to it. Okay. Okay. We can come back to it. Um, we've been talking a lot about black girls because that's your subjectivity, and I have been curious as to whether you have thoughts about representations, visual representations of black boys. Um, what are your observations about visual representations of black boys, and what are your thoughts about that? I don't think you can't not think about it. Um, and I know oftentimes people justify their thought by saying, well, as somebody who has a brother as somebody who is a father. But I, I think even if you had no connection, it should be important to think about. And with that being said, I have two brothers. And um, it's interesting, again, growing up in an environment in which my parents have very intentionally placed us in inclusive spaces. And at the same time, it's been a balance of understanding that we live in, um, in a a much more inclusive space in the rest of the world while not ignoring the fact that this is not our reality. Mm -hmm. 
and that this is not everyone's reality. And so when you're thinking about portrayals of, of black boys, it again goes back to this dehumanization that occurs on um, such an integral level. I remember even one time my brothers were at school and um, my one brother was picking up the other brother. They're 16 and 11. And at the time, this was about a year ago, they went to hug each other and the teacher told them not to hug. Um, and I, I get that different schools have different policies, but there's a moment in which that occurs in which you're not viewing these as two humans with a connection to each other. You're not viewing them as, as two children who are happy to see each other, and it's a denial of joy. And so it's been about how do you reinstate the narrative around joy, whether it's, I think you, everyone's seen the hashtag black boy joy. How do you reinstate narratives surrounding just the everydayness of us rather than these uh, moments that we see in the media? And again, how do we, turn that narrative around because when we talk about Tamir Rice, which is something that um, makes me really emotional every time we talk about it, but I see that and like, how dare you kill my brother? You see the murder of Nipsey Hussle and it's like, how dare you kill my prophets? And it has everything to do with how we feel placed in this world and to see other people's lack of care is um, world shifting, but it's also very inspirational because it, it reminds me of why we do this work and why you have to advocate for something more than yourself. And when we talk about black womanhood, and we were actually recently having a conversation about black feminism, but so many times we think that it is just a conversation on black womanhood in specific, but it's, it is really a conversation around centering black women, but in inclusion of black women, you have to understand that we automatically care and have considered the intersections of other identities. And we're considering the intersection of immigration, we're considering the intersection of um, what it means to be first generation, what it means to be LGBTQ, plus what it means to be in these other spaces because we automatically hit those intersections and have people that we care about in those intersections as well. And so to, to focus or center on black womanhood and black boyhood is not a selfish act, but rather this idea of expansively caring about everybody. Somebody asked me at school um, if I thought it was worse to be a black woman than a black man. And I said that we have, both of them have issues and it's not about which one is worse. It's about, because comparing gets us nowhere. It's about how black women and black men can work together and lift each other up. Have you thought of a question that you might like to ask Yara? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you can pass. Yeah, I think, um, so you are a role model for a lot of young girls, and I wanted to know how you balance your public life with your personal life. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I'm still figuring it out on a daily basis, but again, going back to why I'm so grateful to have my parents with me every step of the way, they really um, have been there to help me just figure out what brings me joy. And I realize that oftentimes it's not about finding the separate work-life balance, but figuring out where they meet. And as long as whatever I'm doing is purpose-driven, I'm extremely happy. And so it, it's really been um, about like, investing in and pouring into 18 by 18 to figure out what the next iteration of that is. It's been reading a lot of books. I love, I love reading, love listening to podcasts. Um, I think I single-handedly support NPR <laughs> because it's all, all I do, but it's been about finding those personal moments of growth and finding spaces, whether it's this one, which I'm so grateful to be in, or whether it's the Underground Museum in Los Angeles, which if you haven't been there, I highly recommend you go. Um, but just finding spaces in which I'm investing in myself and my own education and expanding because I think it's automatically what really motivates me to then go back out into the world and do whatever work needs to be done. I'd like to know if um, you have advice for other, p other young activists or people who are perhaps not activists who would like to become activists, uh, or advice for adults who would like to support young activists as they work towards justice. 
Um, I often like to say that success looks like you. Um, many people, when they're starting out, they want to speak out. They want to. They want to do almost anything. They just. They look at other people and they compare themselves to other people, and they say that is what success looks like. So I need to do blank to um, be successful. And so I think that it's really about knowing that. Whatever you do makes you successful. If you want to be an activist and you want to put up posters around your school, that's being successful. And if you want to make speeches, that's being successful. If you want to post a video on YouTube of you singing, that's successful. Because whatever you want to do, however far you get, it's, that's successful. Yeah, and I think to your point, we're in a day and age in which you can quantify almost anything. Um, because of social media, you can quantify, I can physically look at my analytics and see how many people I've reached. And, and that can be really dangerous in that we try and quantify our impact or find something that is as tangible as possible, in which that's counterintuitive to how inspiration and how inspiring others actually works. Um, and so I'd have to agree with everything that you've said. And then also just add finding a support network. I'm, extremely grateful to be in a position to have so many mentors, so many of which are in this room, so many people that I pull inspiration from, so many people that I leave feeling inspired and full, and so many people that I can even process with. And it's been about finding intergenerational support and realizing that it's not about recreating the wheel either. You contribute how you can, but I think, like the one, the one tattoo I have on my body is the apostrophe 63 for 1963. And it's a reminder of the work that was done in that year. It's a reminder of what's occurred. And even though it's only one year and one of many that's contributed to the freedoms that I experience now, it has everything to do with the work that I do. It's the year that The Fire Next Time came out. It was the bombing of the Birmingham church. It was the death of Medgar Evers. And it was the March on Washington. And so being in conversations with generations before and after you, I think, is extremely crucial because I think, again, it goes so many times as this generation, we think that we are doing this by ourselves when there have been so many people who have invested in humans that they don't even know. And that's a really powerful act, and I think recognizing that really is um, comforting. Thank you. I'd like to know about something that you've never seen. This is something we talked about before. Something that you've never seen, either in representation or in reality, that you really want to see. This is really a question about what are you visually hungry for? What do you literally want to see? Um, I looked at the editorial board of the New York Times, and it was, <laughs> it was very white and male, and um, I want to see a black woman, preferably myself, running the New York Times. <laughs> um, I'm gonna preface this by saying when I was 13, my favorite book was Catcher in the Rye, much to my dismay now <laughs> when I look back. Um, but what it, it really struck in me is just my familiarity with mainstream culture in which there's been no familiarness with myself. And so the one thing that I always say is like, when you see a person of color and, and somebody in many intersections in a role like Holden Caulfield, in which we are watching them for two hours do nothing in particular, <laughs> and we're okay with that and we're invested, I think that will demonstrate another level of investment. I mean, <laughs> like if you think about a movie like Boyhood, I, I think it, it marks our, our, our general investment in that type of being and the fact that I can watch you do nothing but just exist. And so many times narratives, and we've talked about the confines of being an artist of color, but so many times it has to be about something. And um, I don't think we'll ever escape it having to be about something because that's just um, a side effect of us existing in these bodies. But I think if you can have a narrative in which you're just allowed to exist on screen and people are invested in that, that's gonna mean a lot. So my very last question for you. Um, I would like, we have a, a, an extraordinary audience here, um, both the people in this room and also everybody who is watching online. This is a, a particular audience that has never existed before today, this particular convening. 
And so what I would like to know is, what do you want this audience to know about black girls and vision and justice? I want everybody in this room um, to view black girls with the same potential as anybody else. I want to just say thank you to everybody in this room because you all do such amazing work um, that contributes to the space that we get to reside in and play in. Um, and so I'm really grateful for you all. But the other thing I guess I'd have to say is, you know, we rise together. And, and when you look at anybody's narrative expanding, um, any intersection, any ethnicity, any sexuality, any gender, um, that when you look at that person, you just remind yourself of who are we if not each other and to carry that with you as you interact with everybody. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was fabulous. So thank you, Naomi, Yara, and Robin. That was really incredible. Thank you for the clarity of your voices and your deep empathy and insight. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like that was a call to listen and to understand and to see, and it's a call that I, I happily accept. Um, I can't imagine a, a, a better bookend to the first part of the program, um, and so, um, on Sarah's behalf, I invite everyone to take a break for lunch and then reconvene here at 2 o'clock.